This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ambion Pinda Private Game Reserve. It is a beautiful morning here today. My name is Jared, and behind the camera, we have Marcel. All right, so just a reminder to all the viewers out there, and a special warm welcome to all the kids watching. The first 45 minutes is dedicated to all the kids, so we'll only be filming questions from the kids. And so for those kids who have any questions, please send your questions through to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Now, what a fantastic way to start the morning with a fairly large herd of buffalo. So although now we can probably only see about 10 of them, uh, there is about 60 or so of them in this herd. It is a breeding herd, so that means that it's a herd consisting of males, females, and babies. And there is, in fact, quite a few young calves in this herd. So I'm just going to edge for forward ever so slightly uh, to see if we can get a bit of a better view. Now something that we must definitely look for while this herd is busy walking is the calves busy suckling. So buffalo calves have adapted to suckle on the move. Most other species the calves will suckle from the side. A buffalo calf will go between the back legs and hold on to those teats almost like someone skiing behind a boat and has to suckle because buffaloes are constantly on the move. And just two minutes ago, I was lucky enough to see one of the calves busy suckling like that. You'll see there's a, what the, one of the lighter colored buffalo in the road is a younger calf. Just to the right, and a big boy has just stepped out in front of him. And it looks like there's another calf to the right of that calf, slightly older calf. So when they are born, they are born this lighter brown. And then as they get older, they'll become darker in color. Now you might find that one of the reasons why they are born to be a lighter color is it just helps a little bit more with camouflage. You can see that the grass in this area is yellow and um, who lions will often try and hunt little buffaloes like this. So the more camouflage they can have the better. If they are big and dark like their moms and dads, they wouldn't be able to hide as easily. So those lighter browns just allows for better camouflage. So this herd, I think, has just woken up. So Emma, age 11, buffalo, young buffaloes do not leave the herd. In fact, buffaloes tend to really only leave the herd when they're old. So very different to elephants, whereas a, an elephant in his teens... Um, the females will chase him up because he's a potential threat to the calves. Uh, the buffalo want to keep the males in the herd and as many males as they can. And as I mentioned earlier, lions do like to hunt buffalo. And so if you've got lots of big males, those big males are going to be able to protect all the females and more importantly, protect their babies. Now with elephants, they're not as threatened by lions as what buffalo are. So the females don't really need to have the males around. And a female elephant is big enough to be able to chase off any lions that were to bother them anyway. It's going to keep quiet. You can hear some beautiful birds calling. It's one of my favorite parts of this time of the day. The dawn chorus is almost ending now, but all the beautiful birds are busy calling. We should see some oxpeckers landing very shortly on these buffaloes to come feed or off all the parasites and ticks and maybe we'll hear one or two grunts from this herd that is your very typical buffalo sound So it's actually not just oxpeckers. Everyone just imagines, okay, oxpeckers, they might be the only birds that you're going to find following buffalo. There are some other birds like the cattle egret, which is a big white bird who will walk around at the feet of the buffalo um, to catch any insects. Now, I don't see any cattle egrets, and they're actually not a very common bird in this area. But something that we must definitely look out for is a bird called a forktail dronga. It's a blackbird uh, and starlings as well. Oh, there's a forktail dronga just flying over them now. And they're going to be jumping from tree to tree following these buffalo. Because as these buffalo are walking through the grass, you're going to find that they're going to be chasing insects out of the grass 
which just allows for the fork tail drongas to catch those insects. Now, must I have a look at this female walking in the back? We can see that some of the oxpeckers have already arrived. Looks like oh, they've just hit on the other side of her. They saw me pointing at them and said, no, we're not here. Um, but they busy sitting on these buffaloes to feed off any ticks and parasites. Right, let's see if we can get a little bit closer. All you kids were on my vehicle at the moment and you could smell the interesting smells coming from these buffaloes. If you've ever been to a farm where there's cattle, buffaloes have a similar smell to that. Oh, there's a little calf in the road. Have a look at that. Let's have a look to see if it's got any horns yet. Yeah, I can see that maybe about an inch or so of horn. So we know that that's maybe probably about a two month old buffalo. Fantastic. What a way to start the morning. All right, everyone. So we're going to be sending you over to, I think it was Juma. Um, might be mistaken, to see what they have and give you a little warm welcome today. Warm welcome indeed. It's a little warmer than usual this morning. It's about 13 degrees Celsius or 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, but it is a little bit gloomy. And we're just looking out towards the east of Juma there, while we are actually sitting in the west. So a wonderful scene. Hello everyone, welcome aboard. My name is Trishala with BK on camera this morning. And we are, like I said, in the west. So we're going to hope to maybe find out one of the animals that we usually see in the west. But it's not so predictable anymore. Now those animals would be the leopard kind, Hukumuri and Shudulu. But they seem to be all over the place because they're mating. So we're just gonna try our luck. Now also, I'm using this way, just in case we get lucky with them. I do love the hook. I'm using this particular road to get down to the south, where I want to check the southern boundary for the lions again. That's because last night and even this morning we had quite a bit of audio for them. Now, in this silver cluster leaf right here, there is a blue wax ball. Where have you gone now? Can you hear them? Very sweet, faint sound. They seem to have hopped off. That is a silver cluster leaf, everyone. You can see that it's starting to get a little bit brown. Plants are just like animals in many ways. In that they need nutrients to survive. They need to reproduce. And they have a vascular system, almost like veins and, and arteries. And you can see that they've started to stop sending much of that nutrients to their leaves because it's getting colder and they want to survive the winter. Well, I'm going to send you over to Taylor at Prylands to say good morning, and I'm going to head down south. Hello everybody. I said exactly what Trishada said I was going to do, but we've started the day off with two young male lions just resting up in the open area. And we've been hearing them calling all night long. I'm so happy, finally, some male lions. My name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera today is Gert and we are at Pride Lands at Eco Training. And it's very, very misty this morning. So you are going to see Gert's cloth come across the lens every now and then don't worry it's just that it keeps fogging up we want to make sure that you have the clearest view so as we arrived into this open area we sort of <laughs> I, I didn't know what I was looking at at first I thought I was looking at an impala or something because they're so well camouflaged as male lines there's the other one just hiding behind the bushes but they're a little bit nervous so I'm going to try and keep my distance they don't seem to be too happy with the vehicles I'm sure they've interacted with vehicles very often. But we're just, we're just, luckily for us, we've got these amazing cameras and we can sit from a little bit further away, which is super cool. I'm happy to see them. They don't look very old. 
you can see that their manes are still sort of starting. It hasn't quite linked around on its neck and over their shoulders and back around to their elbows. You can actually see on this other male lion on the left quite nicely what I'm talking about, which is, I'll show you, we'll show you now. So if you see there, look at his mane. So you can see normally what happens when they get to about six years old or so, that mane goes from their chest and their neck and then goes over the shoulder and joins almost um, where, they, where they get a bit of fluff on their elbow. So you can see this hasn't happened just yet. So I think these boys are around four years old or so. They've been chased away from whichever pride they used to belong to. And now they'll be quite nomadic moving around trying to avoid the other male lions because there is a big dominant pair of boys that live around here. I haven't seen them just yet, but they are believed to be about eight, nine years old or so. But it does look like they've been scrapping quite a bit. Look at all those scratches on their faces. They are very pretty though. I like the little mohawk stage that they're going through. And we have got beautiful eyes, very light colored eyes too. But this is normal, so don't worry, even though they do look like they've been bashed about a little bit. This is very typical for young male lions. Now, Ruth, lions can get quite big. The males, the boys, are much larger than the girls. So a really big male lion, once he's full grown, can weigh anywhere between 220 and maybe 280 kilograms. Obviously, maybe 250 being um, a decent weight. And then females are normally around 150 kilograms maybe up to 170 kilograms or so. Again, once they're fully grown. I mean, these boys are going to have really big feet, but they haven't quite grown into themselves just yet. They're still lacking muscle. And it, it, it's this awkward teenage phase, basically, where they're kind of long and gangly, but they don't really have too much to show for it. Not yet, but they will become beautiful. And it doesn't look like they've been doing much cleaning of their, or grooming of their coats They've got leaves in their manes. Their manes look very tacky. Their coats don't look nice and sleek and shiny. But I think when you've been running away trying to avoid the big males that live in this area, the last thing you have to worry about is brushing your hair. Isn't that right, boy? But it'd be nice to look at them and get some screenshots here if you can help me. Um, so we can use for ID. You can see that this young male in his left ear has got a nice nick in it. And actually both of them. So we can definitely use those to identify this fella. And then the other one we'll have a look at just now. Now, Gabriel, Pridelands is quite a big area. Uh, we, remember, so it's all open to the Greater Kruger National Park. So that's about four and a half million hectares of wilderness that these animals have got to roam around. It's a huge space, but where we can drive around, so Pridelands itself is about a thousand, between a thousand eight hundred and nine, one thousand nine hundred hectares, which is quite big. But then we can also drive on another property called Quenga, and that's about one thousand three hundred hectares or so, give or take a little bit. So We've got well over 3,000 hectares to drive around on. And for a big open ecosystem like this, very spoiled. It's almost, it's so big for one person. For me, at the moment, driving around trying to find animals can sometimes be quite tricky because I can't get to all the corners. And we've barely been exploring just yet. We haven't been over to Quenga. And I think that th these males that we're looking at right now were with uh, a pride of lions yesterday. They were sort of tailing behind them. But they gave us the slip and they crossed north out of our traverse where we can drive. So I'm glad that they've come back. But let's quickly have a look at this male. And let's finish the IDing here. So you can see his ears are nice and smooth. They're not tattered like his um, coalition members' ears. But he's also got a very big scar here on his left eye. I think that that will be there for quite some time. And then also got another scar, a scar in between his eyes going across the ridge of his nose. So it'd be nice to just try and get some of these shots and hashtag wild earth. Please share them on Twitter, on social media so we can go back because we do need to try and put some nice ID kits together and eventually give these two young boys uh, a coalition name. Um, but this is going to be some of the fun things that we will do over time. Just as uh, myself and Mike, who will be presenting also from Eco Training, as we start to see these animals and familiarize ourselves with them. 
can see they're starting to get a little bit tired now, hey? Those eyes are growing very heavy. They've probably been out all night. I heard them at about midnight, roaring. And then again at about quarter to five, they roared again. And it sounded a lot further away from where we found them. So they must have been on the move. Something keeps drawing their attention to behind them. Not right now, but I am. if I do go quiet, it's just because I'm listening. They were, sounded like there were some distress calls from coming from somewhere else, but I can't quite figure out what it is. Ivy, I really like the look of these males. I think they've got nice character. I like that they've got very light eyes, too. They're golden. And it'll be interesting to see them in, in well next couple of years and see how they really grow into themselves and see how big their manes get. The one on the left's mane is much bigger than this boy. As you can see, his his mane is slightly shaggy. So th this is the other thing, is that I don't know if they've come from the same pride, these two boys, if they are, you know, blood brothers from one lioness or are, are they, you know, a couple of months apart from two different lionesses from the same pride or did they just meet up along the way when they dispersed from their pride? And are they not related at all? So we will do digging. The internet is a great place to find all sorts of pictures. And I know a lot of you are really good at that. So I will check Prideland's Conservancy, Conservancy sorry, Facebook pages and they've got Instagram and all those things. And I'll ask people in the surrounding areas because I'm sure these boys go up into Jijani. They've definitely gone to Quenga. So we'll be finding people who have seen these animals and maybe they can tell us, you know, oh, they've seen them here, they know which pride they're from. So we have to play investigator now because these animals aren't followed like they're followed in the Sabi Sands, uh, you know, where people have been following them for years and years and years. And these boys could have come from far and wide. They could have come from the Klesiri or they could have even come from Baluli or maybe even in Kruger National Park somewhere. But... It's not only the few of us that you've already met this morning. There's someone you haven't seen just yet. Let's go over and say hello to Steve. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Steve, and I'm joined this morning by Varna, who's come in, uh, and he's working with us today. So lovely to have him with us, and lovely to have all of you on board. Welcome. So this morning... We're trying to follow up on tracks of Tandy from last night. She uh, deposited her cub in this block. Trish found the tracks of the cub and of Tandy. Then I tracked Tandy around the block into the drainage. And I came all the way around again. And we found a very fresh leopard poo in the road. And went back into the same area. So we're just trying to investigate. Double checking. She hasn't come out of there with her cub. Because uh, Tandy is our 13, 14 year old leopard of the area, female leopard. She's got a little three and a half or four month old boy. It's very cool. Love to show him to you. And we were just talking before we came on air about how we would be very lucky if we found them. And then a bird of prey flew right over our head, which in Native American tradition is a very good omen. So I'm excited. I'm just double checking no one's come out of the block and um, there is her track but that is from last night it's not very clear it's really not clear she came straight up here last night you're not gonna be able to see it I'm just gonna double check that there's no cub with her I don't know if you can see that and it's not very clear is it not very clear at all with the light but with my eyes I can see it now but she came up here last night and she went down that road I'm just going to double check that the cub didn't come with her or if there's a second track I'm sure that's the same one and she walked all the way down in the afternoon we had uh, impalas going a bit crazy down there we're pretty sure she was giving them a hard time but we couldn't find her she's elusive we discussed leopard habitats, and that was exactly the area you expect to find leopard in. Here on the right-hand side, into this little drainage system, the river iron system. It's the most ideal place 
for a leopard to hide their cubs. And she actually spent a lot of time two years ago with Columba just down here. So I'm gonna go check some of those spots. In the meantime, I'm gonna send you over to Jared, who's looking at the sunrise. All right, so while we give Steve some time to try find Tandy, have a look at this beautiful African sunrise we have this morning. One of the things that's making this particular one so special is above the clouds, we have, well, sorry, <laughs> above the sun, we have some clouds, and then below the sun, we've got some mist. Now, that mist is actually rolling from the ocean. We're not particularly far from the ocean, probably about 20 kilometers. And if that mist does start to dissipate, we will even be able to see the sand dunes, which is right next to the ocean over here. But incredible. So we're still with the buffalo. You might be able to hear some of the ox pickers behind us going. A very big herd has just landed with the buffalo. Tammy, this is absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite things in the morning. I've still got my cup of coffee and I'm busy sipping away at my coffee while I watch the sun rise. And uh, these opportunities are also great for us as guides because not only can we enjoy the, the, the majesty that Africa has to offer, but it also gives us an opportunity to just stop and listen. And what we'll be listening for is maybe lions roaring early in the morning, letting off their last territorial call, or a leopard busy soaring doing the same thing. We might hear monkeys and baboons and impalas alarm calling if they see a predator. Um, like I said earlier, you can hear these ox peckers busy chirping away. If we were looking for rhinos or buffalo, uh, we'd also listen out for these ox peckers to hear them chirping away as they often make when they're busy landing on the buffalo or when they're flying off. But isn't that just gorgeous? You can start to see the sort of golden lining along the clouds and <laughs> uh, Dala, I couldn't agree more. Being a naturalist is a hard life. We've got to deal with beautiful sunrises and sunsets and, and big moon rises and surrounded by wild animals and fresh air. Someone has to live at a Dal. Um, and I guess today it is me. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. And it's not actually even that cold today. We we're expecting it to be a lot colder. Uh, there is some reports of snow in the Drakensberg Mountain, although that is not particularly close to us. We will feel the cold that would come from that. Um, but at the moment, it's around 14 degrees here at Pindar, and that's also why we're having this mist at the moment. As the st sun starts to rise, it starts to heat up the earth, and um, a lot of fancy things happen, and then voila, we have some beautiful mist rolling in. Et voila. And voila. <laughs> That is as much French as I can speak. All right, have a, let's have a quick look at the buffalo. Let's go a little bit forward. And earlier I mentioned that we could see some other birds with these buffalo, like forktail drongas. And I did see some with them maybe about two minutes ago. Uh, so let's see if we can get another view of those forktail drongas. And uh, the buffalo have seemed to find a very good area to graze. So they grazes, they eat grass. And I think they were walking to this particular area because they know that this area is good for grass. And you'll notice even though it is quite, the grass is quite yellow, there is still a bit of greenery in this area. And this is one of the herds of buffalo that frequents this particular area. And they know where all the good grazing is, which is high nutrients. And as we start to go more and more into winter, all these grass are going to start to die off and um, they need to make as much of an opportunity as they can to feed on the lush green grass. Now Marcel, the challenge is to find a forktail dronga. Let's see who can find it first. And I know they're here, I've heard them. And there was four while we were viewing the sun and now they've disappeared. As they do. <laughs> as they do. They are camera shy today. Okay. 
Uh, sorry, can you repeat that question? I didn't catch it. Do buffaloes play like others? To what? Do buffaloes use their tail to flag other animals? Like oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Do buffaloes use their tails to flag other animals? No. So, um, for those of you who don't know what Dave is talking about, when a buffalo runs off, they put their tail in the air like this, straight, straight up, almost like an antenna running behind them. Sorry, a warthog <laughs> with their, their tail right behind them. Now, a buffalo doesn't do that. Uh, what they would do to warn other animals is that they would give off a sort of alarm grunt. Um, just a, uh, just a, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> like myself. So it sounds like someone who's feeling very sick. Uh, but no, they do not let off their tail or lift up their tail to warn others like warthogs do. Oh, I still have a look. Remember I was saying to you earlier about how the buffalo suckle? Oh, <laughs> as, as I start to show, let's see if the calf's going to start it, try again. And there we go. See, holding on to the teat. I'm just going to keep quiet. I think I'm distracting the calf. Come on, suckle. Come on, There we go. So you'll see that the calf, because the, the, the mothers are always on the move, they have to suckle from behind. And it's going to try bite and hold on to that teat and suckle as much as it can. There we go. No, it's also camera shy, just like the fork tail drongas. There we go. Busy suckling from behind. Oh, so we've just heard some lions busy roaring off in the distance. So I think I'm going to leave these buffalo now and we're going to head into that area where the, the lions are busy roaring, maybe only about a kilometer away, probably between here and the lodge. So let's head over to Trish while we go search for those lions. Exciting. <laughs> Very exciting in fact I am hoping for much of the same I'm on the southern boundary and I was looking for lion tracks entering Juma and I stumbled upon this little herd it is bigger than this there are a few more elephants on the northern side of me but these two gave me a bit of a roadblock in fact it's not just two Tiny little baby. Can you see how that baby's ears are not waving about, but it's against its body? That's because all those veins behind the ears that help it cool down, it's trying to cover them up so it can stay warm. It's not used to its trunk just yet. It's probably about under a year old, I would say. I can't tell you exactly how much, but definitely under a year. There we go. Oh, look how floppy that trunk is. It's trying so hard. Use its trunk like the adults do. Now, adults would put their wrap their trunk around that branch and then strip it. That's what that animal is trying to do, the little one. Look how well she uses her trunk. She's very much in control of the trunk. They're dusting off any, gra any sand on the grass before they eat it so they don't damage their teeth.
Sorry, guys, we had a small drop, but we're back. And we're still with these lovely Ellie's. I think they're gonna cross in front of us. That would be awesome. Hi, Julian. You're four years old. You'd like, you know, do elephants sleep? Lying down or standing up? They do both. You know, sometimes, Julian, you sleep and you have a really good night's sleep and you have dreams and all of that. That's necessary. But in order for that to happen, we call that REM sleep. In order for that to happen, elephants have to lie down. So you'll see adults lying down, but not for very long, just for a few minutes. Babies sleep lying down a lot more. But when they just want to rest, then they sleep standing up. Now they can do that because they have something called a stay apparatus. That's how they, it's kind of a way that their legs can stay locked without them putting any effort into it. So they won't just suddenly collapse. But you do see them kind of sway to one side sometimes. So calm. I'm going to be a little bit quiet because I want to listen. See if we can hear lions because there's been reports audio for lines coming from this side. You can watch this cute little thing in the middle. Is, oh, do you have a great question? You'd like to know why do animals get up so early in the morning? Well, they actually sleep whenever they feel like and are awake whenever they feel like. They're not like us where we've got to go to bed at a certain time and wake up at a certain time. Some animals are, like mongoose are a great example of that. They like to get into their burrows as soon as the sun is down and only wake up when the sun is up. But other animals, they're not used to having a bed and a house and going to work and things like that. So they just eat and sleep and are awake whenever they like. Standing by, Nigel. Copy, which section of Gary main? Okay, copy. I just came from Shibama towards Weavers and didn't see anything. Thanks, Nigel. I've got some Elise here. So, some tracks have been picked up. For lions. But it seems like the pride has actually gone back into little Gari, but there may be a male that has come north into Juma. So we're going to go and check that out. They almost look like field workers collecting hay or something. Sweet. 
All right, so those tracks are fresh. So we're gonna back out and we're gonna oh, maybe they'll let us go past since they've been so nice to us. Sometimes it's nice just to wait so they get used to the sound. And then you can pass them. Thank you, guys. You are awesome. Thank you. All right, I'm going to check out these tracks. And then I'm going to send you over to Anne Beyond's Pinder. Apparently, they found what I'm looking for. Lines right next to the leopard. Right, everyone, welcome back. We've just come to some intense scenes. Some lions have just cornered a leopard um, over here. Listen, listen. Just going to keep quiet so you can listen. Looks like a big male leopard. He's surrounded by these lions. I know it might be a little bit tough to see, but you might be able to hear. This is absolutely intense. I'm busy shaking, I'm not sure how this leopard is feeling right now. It seems like this leopard has managed to defend himself. Most of these lions that are here are quite young lions. Uh, it seems like it's the cub that's got majority of, the prize has got majority of the cubs. Um, doesn't look like the lip, li leopard's been injured yet. Just listen, listen. Alright, so now it's quite a difficult view. Uh, there is one or two windows of where we can see the lions and the leopards. I think Marcel's busy viewing the leopards at the moment. I do apologize about the camera being shaky. Um, Marcel had to take it off of... Oh, here comes a lion. Roger. Roger, Roger. Mm. Wow. Mm. One of the lions just came right up to the bonnet of my vehicle to come have a look. And has gone back down again. Probably one of the cubs is a little bit nervous about what's going on. Listen to the growling of the leopard. Marcel, I think if you try sit here. Okay, we're just going to try to get Marcel into a different position. I see the leopard through there. Not really, eh? I think you're more angled. Ah. Yeah, I think I've got it. Yeah, just... So you can probably just see the rosettes of the leopard. Uh, there is one of the... Younger lions, maybe two meters or so to the left of the leopard. Um, one of the larger females seems to be towards the right of this leopard. I think that this leopard's going to be able to survive this. So, fortunately, I think that we don't have to stress too much, but it is a very stressful moment, particularly for this leopard. Looks like one of the lions is right behind the leopard. You'll notice that the leopard's on its back, and by being on the back like this, it's able to defend itself as best as it can. Apologies for that, Marcel's HQ is just busy trying to get hold of Marcel. Shameless Leopard's having a terrible day. I'm going to keep quiet for a minute or so, so you can listen. I think this leopard's made a kill. I can hear the lions busy fighting over something to the right that's away from the leopard. So I think they've stolen a kill from this leopard. Some have been feeding and some have been harassing the leopard. All right, so the leopard's just taking this opportunity to move off while the lions came down. So unfortunately, where we are, there's no tall trees and that's why the leopard hasn't been able to climb into any of the trees. There we go, the leopard's busy growling to my left. There's a lion coming back. Mm. 
and it's really just a one meter window <laughs> that's fine i do apologize that you guys can't see too much but and vu i couldn't agree more i want this leopard to run or more so than run climb find the closest tree he needs to find a nice tall tree lions can climb trees but he's much lighter than the lions and so he can get you parts of the trees where the lions wouldn't be able to get to there's a better climber oh do you have that deep growl Sandra, can you guys turn off, please? Sandra, do you guys have a better view that side? I was just speaking to my colleagues who managed to find these lions. Remember earlier we said we heard the lions roaring and so we let them know and they came into this area. It must have been about the time that they've just come across this leopard. So this poor leopard's had these lions harassing them for about 20 minutes or so. But it seems like the growling of the male leopards calmed down so maybe the leopard's able to have moved off from here. Now these lions are looking down to my right is where I think that there's a kill. I think this leopard's very lucky that the male lions that are part of this pride isn't here. Um, because male lions being much larger than the females would have been able to kill that leopard easily. Derek, at the moment it doesn't look like there's any large tree. I can see one sort of larger tree to my left, but nothing too big. Because um, generally that's what lion, uh, leopards would do. The moment they see a predator, or another predator like wild dogs or lions in this case, they would find the closest tall tree that they can get into. But I think these trees are quite small, and if they had to get into the tree, the lions might be able to follow from below. Lions are very capable of climbing trees, not as good as leopards, um, but they want a tall tree so they can get high up to the top where the lions wouldn't be able to get to. Listen. That's a contact call. I think it's one of the cubs busy calling out to its mother. I'm very interested to see. I did have a look with my binoculars. It didn't look like that leopard had any injuries on it. But I'm sure he swatted a couple of good shots at those lions. And I wouldn't be surprised if we don't find some scratches on some of these lions a little bit later. So it just is too thick to be able to get into over here. So I think we're going to have to wait a little bit later for these lions to, once they've done feeding on this carcass, well, I think there's a carcass, um, down to the bottom once they leave it is quite open so I'm sure later on today they're going to come out into the open area but I think fortunately this leopard has got away thank goodness Whew, that was intense this is a first for me in my seven years of being a guide um, I've seen lions chase leopards up into trees before but almost no interaction at all over here we had the leopard on its back, busy swatting towards the lions, the lions surrounding him, trying to come in, and the leopard exposing his paws and those long claws towards those lions, which was a little bit threatening towards them. All right, so while I get my breath back, that was quite intense. Um, I'm going to have a look around, see if we can find a better window uh, to see those lions feeding, but let's head over to Twali for now. Morning from a, a slightly blustery day in the Kalahari. We are here at Swalu. Um, as always, Jandre on camera, and my name is Dylan. Um, it's great to have you with us again. And we, we've decided to come back to Mosadi and a little group of meerkats this morning just to see what they're up to. Um, they're definitely back in this burrow system here. Um, still no sign of the others, unfortunately. 
Um, but we're just going to spend a little bit of time here today and just see what, what, what uh, transpires. We are in for an incredibly blustery and cold next couple of days. Our temperatures are going to go to a maximum of 10 degrees, that's centigrade, and um, going down to a low of minus 2 with a lot of wind. So the wind chill factor is going to go make make the temperature go down even further. Um, but yeah, you know, Jandre and I, I think we'll find ways of surviving. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just, it's always good being out and, and having you with us. So let's see what the next couple of days holds. Um, yeah, that, that cold front should last. It'll be from Thursday to right through to Saturday. So it's going to be quite chilly over those coming days. Um, hey, but that's fun anyway. It's also, the weather is part of these experiences. So I hope our... All our colleagues down in the low felt don't get this cold front. So these cold fronts, in terms of, interestingly, just in terms of weather phenomena, our cold fronts that we get at Swalu Kalahari are normally pushing in from the Atlantic seaboard. So what we've got now, this morning, you can see like a lot of movement on the grass, a lot of wind. So the wind, that direction that Jandro is now pointing at is, is pretty much due north. So you get the wind coming out the north, so it's a northerly wind pushing south. So what happens is it's blowing from a high pressure cell clear cold air into a low pressure cell which is what's developing over the Atlantic um, and over the next couple of days you'll see the wind is going to make a 180 degree shift it's going to start blowing straight out the south and that's when the cold weather is going to hit us um, it's going to be quite a cloudy very very windy um, and of course that's going to have a big impact on things like meerkats artfark pangolin and again, geez, that pangolin sighting we had yesterday was just off the charts. As Jandre and I were chatting about it on the way home. Eh? And um, then also something interesting in terms of how little we know about these environments. Um, on the way home, we encountered a mouse. Now, a mouse would be like, oh, yeah, it's, well, it's another mouse, you know. But you've got little photographs of this mouse, very, very grainy, not, not great, um, just on a cell phone. Um, but it's called a cape short-tailed mouse or short short-tailed gerbil that's a new species for our species list they're very common in southern africa it's not that they're uncommon it's a common species but we've never recorded them on swallow before so it just shows you um jandre got a new mammal for his his record yesterday and i also got a new mammal so, so that's like whoa it's like a win-win there um so it just shows you you never know what you're going to get and the more time you spend outside whether it's in your garden or in a reserve or a national park, um, you can always, if you keep your eyes open, you're always in for a chance of finding something new. So we weren't here yesterday. Our meerkat habituated Rebecca, she was. Um, so we're not sure which actual burrow hole they went down, um, but they're definitely at this, um, at this burrow system. So it's going to take us a little bit of time with this wind, um, you know, they're probably going to come out a little bit later than usual. Um, but we're also just very keen to keep tabs on this group and just see what they're actually going to be doing, you know, over the, over the coming days with this cold weather and with this badger incident that went on. It'll be just really nice to keep following them and just seeing so we don't lose track of the group. Um, but while we're waiting and having a, another cup of coffee, um, yeah, great having you with and head over to Pinda and see what they got. Good morning, everybody. You know, quite an interesting morning from and beyond in Gala here. As you can see this morning, we've, we found one of the dominant males in this part of the reserve. And he's been every now and again getting up and moving and walking around. And we've been getting some really nice views of him. For now, he's just sat down and it looks like he's listening. By the way, my name is Eric and behind camera, as always, is Owen. And like I say, quite an interesting morning this morning. It's been very overcast, very, very misty. But luckily, we were able to hear this male lion calling several different times before we found him. And he's by himself. He's usually got a brother, and he's um, part of the, the Birmingham Pride at the moment. So usually, you know, he, he's not by himself. And so the, I think that's why he's been spending a lot of time calling. Uh, it serves two different purposes, I guess. I mean, it helps him find the rest of the pride. S 
And so, yeah, he's been calling out, he's been listening, he's been trying to find either his brother or trying to find the rest of the pride. And in doing that, it's, it helps mark his territory, it helps let everyone else know that this is his spot. And he's taking a, a quick little nap. I hope he gets up and, and moves around. And whilst he's sleeping, just a reminder that the, the kids' session has now officially come to an end. And so we welcome questions from the rest of the viewers. But kids, please continue on watching and keep sending through your questions. And just look, as soon as Owen zooms out like that, just look at the colors of this male lion. And if he wasn't moving around as much as he is, it would be incredibly difficult to spot him. He's got quite a light face, but the rest of his mane is just perfectly, perfectly, perfectly uh, exactly the same color as, as the rest of the grass. Where we found him is, is quite far away. It looks like he might. What is he going to do? I thought he might yawn. But just look at that face as he opens his eyes and faces directly towards us. Look at the battle scars around the bridge of his nose. Look how dark that nose is. Look around his eyes. He's had some serious fights in the past. You can see if you look at the very, very top of his ears, there's lots of little notches in those ears there. Yeah. Michelle, absolutely, he is majestic. And the I'm sure if you've been watching over the last couple of months, you, you might have seen these males quite often. And you know, I wouldn't classify them as the, the biggest male lions that I've ever seen in my life. But they still have got this presence around them when you see them. They're just absolutely beautiful. And what they lack in size, they, they have an aggression. And they really work well together as a team to drive away potential threats. And we've been thinking, and there's been one or two times where it was in the balance where we thought that maybe they could get chased away by, by a few other dominant male co coalitions that are in the area. There was one two male coalition that came in from the east um, so somewhere around the Kruger National Park and and they were literally one day they were right in the middle of the Timbavati River pretty much exactly where that lioness gave birth to her cubs so before she gave birth but I mean uh, several months ago and they were there they were vocalizing they were roaring the pride of lions the Birmingham pride they turned and they ran in the opposite direction so we thought you know this is going to be the, the time where these male lions get or these Ross males at least get chased away but two days later, Ross males were found again in the morning, being dominant, scent marking, vocalizing exactly where we last left those two unknown males. And so as soon as they feel that there's a potential challenger in the area, they um, flip a switch and they just go full on male lion. Now, Puma, you're asking more to me to explain a little bit more about the coalitions versus prides. So, coalitions are male lions. And male lions are basically from the same litter most of the time. And so, for an example, the, the Birmingham pride that we've been seeing a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the time is within the eight cubs, there's three males. When they get sexually active, which is usually around two and a half, three years old, they leave the pride. And when they leave the pride, they go and look for, for a new area to try and take over. And as a result, they form a coalition because it's a lot easier for them to, um, to take over new areas, to defend prides. Whereas prides tend to be more females. And so the females would, are a lot more consistent. You'll have the core set of females and then their cubs vary from time to time. So the females of the, the same litter of those males that would leave would stay within the pride. So 
And whilst we wait for, for this sleepy lion to either com completely settle down and rest for the day, or decide to get up and move one more time, whilst we wait, we'll send you across to Ambion Pinda, where I think those lions might be a little bit more active. So it seems that I was right. Um, these lions are busy feeding on what looks like an inyala. I haven't had a really good view of what they're feeding on yet. I just saw one of the legs come up. And so, like I said, I expect that this is a inyala that the leopard killed earlier. And I wonder if these lions didn't hear the leopard kill the inyala and then come over to investigate and chase it away. Now I just want Marcel to quickly shine, um, film the um, tree to our left. So we'll have a look there just now, but I can see lots of claw marks going up that tree. So I think that these lions chased the leopard up the tree and might have followed. And then maybe the leopard jumped out of the tree, ran for the drainage line, which is where we saw them busy fighting. And that's where the lions managed to corner him in the drainage line. You're probably hoping to find some taller trees like this one in that drainage line. And on that riverine behind us. Um, but yes, fortunately it looks like he managed to get away unharmed. I guess time will tell, we'll have to go look for him to see if there's any wounds, but I haven't seen any. And there's still a little bit of tension over here. I can see that the youngsters are being very cautious around the mother. So the one that's busy feeding at the moment is um, the younger adult of the female. I haven't seen the old lioness yet. I'm not sure if she's still where we left them earlier around the area where that leopard was. As far as we can see, I've only seen one adult and four youngsters. Now it does sound like I can hear some chewing off to my right. So it does sound like that some of the youngsters might have been able to get some of this carcass. But it seems that this larger female is, or adult female is feeding on the majority of the carcass. And it's been quite interesting because you'll often find that the cubs and juveniles will dominate the adults off of the kill. But I think with everything that has happened this morning, and it's been quite a tense moment, um, I think even they're a little bit nervous and have approached the adult female very gingerly, which they generally don't. Normally the four of them will just completely bully the adults off of the kill, and they tend to get the majority of the meat. Yeah, it looks like one of the younger females busy walking around smelling. You can see her nose down to the ground trying to see if she can pick up any scraps that have been left behind. So when these lions were fighting over this carcass earlier, when I heard it while we were with the leopard, I'm sure it was pulled apart. And there's bits and pieces of this, like I said, I think it's an inyala, of this inyala all over the area here. Now we'll never know, maybe this leopard had the inyala in the tree and the lions jumped up into the tree and chased the leopard off and were able to drop the carcass out of the tree. I guess we'll never know, but there's a few options. But I think let's just keep quiet for a while and listen to them chomping away, listen to the grunts that they have, little growls towards each other. chirping off in the distance. A little bit of a growl there from the two siblings, maybe the one got too close to the other sibling that was feeding. hear a variety of sounds busy happening you'll hear that oops sorry that just distracted her that's the sound of the carnassial shears busy cutting away at the hide you'll occasionally hear them accidentally bite down onto the bone that sound 
They are making you so right. Lions are big time thieves. Um, everyone just thinks it's hyenas who are the scavengers of the bush and bully everyone off of their kills. But lions do it maybe not as often, but quite often. If they can chase a leopard or a cheetah off of its kill, which is something that we do see happen on Pinder quite a bit. So the reason why there was a little bit of growling is one of the young males came over towards the female that's busy feeding and she was just letting him know, you come close, you're going to get a swat. Shame, what an eventful morning it's been for these four youngsters. It might have been their first time they've ever interacted with a leopard. <laughs> Marcel, Marcel um, you're saying snap, crackle, pop. <laughs> Just like the Rice Krispies logo. Yeah, you do hear quite a bit of snap, crackling, and popping. Although there won't be too much snapping here. Yeah? The lions um, don't generally tend to break bones, so you won't get too many cracking. I'm just going to edge forward a little bit and then we'll stop to listen again. I can see some of the youngsters busy feeding next to each other. That's where most of the grunting is busy happening. So let's see if we can see what's happening to them. And once I stop, I'll keep quiet again to let all you lovely viewers listen to what is happening over here. Tell me when to stop them or so. Right. an impala it was very difficult to see earlier because there were lots of trees in my way but this the one of these lines that's busy feeding at the moment just lifted up the leg and it had that distinctive black dot just above the hoof which is a gland that the impalas have so i will have to correct myself they are feeding on an impala saying something to the part, I'm not sure exactly what. Often they'll make those contact calls and they're calling each other. Oh, he's just found a piece of meat there. Myself, can you see the young male in the back? Mm -hmm. The female busy carrying off the hide. And it doesn't look like there's much meat left there, but there. All having to take whatever scraps they can right now. Their bellies are quite full, so they're being a bit greedy at the moment. 
Um, not too far from where we are here, we did see that these lions had killed a warthog last night. Oh, so that's a crazy eventful last 12 hours for them. Hunting and killing a warthog, fighting with a leopard this morning, stealing its impala kill, fighting over this kill. Indeed, some tense moments here. From there. So the males coming back to where everyone was feeding to try to see if they draw. Oh, he's got a little bit of blood on his back, leg, and looks like a bit of a wound. I wonder if it was from that leopard. Maybe got just too close. Being one of the young males or younger males in the pride, he might have been a little bit too eager to prove his might to the rest of the pride. I'm just going to reverse. See if we can get another view of this young male. He's gone over to the female. Let me know when it's good to stop there, Marcel. Okay. So it looks like there's one, two, three, four of them over here, all waiting their turn, waiting for the large bear. For the mother of two of them, or sorry, the mother of three of them, to stop feeding. And maybe what you found is that last night when they killed the warthog, I haven't seen her stand, so I haven't been able to see her belly. But most likely what would have happened is that when she killed the water glass night, she would have let the full feed. And so maybe that's why she's making the most of this opportunity. They fed last night. It's now time for her to feed this morning. That's <laughs> the other one. It's busy lying right behind her, as close as I can to the carcass. So James, Richard, we we actually have quite a few leopards here on Pinda. So we've got a very high density of leopards here. Unfortunately, most of the leopards, and, and like that male we saw earlier, are quite shy. So in the southern parts of the reserve, we probably have about three or four individuals who are um, just as relaxed as the leopards that you see at Duma and Angola. And so we do see them fairly often. Um, but I would say about 80% of the leopards that we have here on Pindo are unfortunately not used to the vehicles and they generally tend to move off the moment they see us. And so most of the leopards that are here that we do view are females. We've got one or two males in the south of the reserve who are okay with us viewing them, more so at night than in the daytime. And then in the north of the reserve there is um, one or two young leopards who have just recently become independent who are quite relaxed but their mother is very unrelaxed so not the best leopard viewing in in the world but if you do ever come and visit here we do tend to at least see one leopard in a stay if you like it looks like one of the young females is heading straight back into the direction where the lions are busy fighting with the leopard earlier i wonder what it's going to go do Right, so I think uh, from one line to the next, although Eric's got some sleeping lines, I'm sure he's got some interesting stories to tell you. Welcome back to Ngala, everybody. As you can see, that big white blob just off center on the screen is that male lion. And he hasn't moved around pretty much at all since we last left him and now that he's got his head down flat panting quite heavily it might be the the end of his day for now uh, every now and again he picks up his head and it sounds like he's responding to some noises around him but he hasn't really given any sign of movement yet you know we've been in the same spot for since we last left you and we haven't heard anything either so and maybe he's decided to give up he hasn't heard the response of any of the the pride members that he's looking for and so maybe he's just deciding that it's now a good time to conserve energy and rest 
and then he might try again this afternoon by walking and vocalizing and and roaring occasionally to try and find the rest of the pride. Crafty Jacks, absolutely, and I think you know, why, what makes it a, a lion type of morning is the weather that we're experiencing. I mean, I'm not sure what's, what the weather's like down at Pinder, but I'm sure at least down in Juma, at Pridelands, it's very, very overcast, and only now has the, list, the, has the mist started to rise. And with all of this moisture in the air, it just cools the temperature down, it allows them to move around without the worry of trying to cool themselves down. Uh, on, like they would normally have to do on a hot day and then also with the it's lifted now unfortunately but with the mist it kind of gave them an, an extra bit of cover so that they could work with and if they were unsuccessful hunting last night it would have been a really good time to be moving around in the early parts of the morning and this male lion doesn't look completely underfed he hasn't had a, a proper full male bear meal recently i mean i'm sure you've seen a male lion after a big feed those bellies swell up to about two times the, the size of what it is now but there's no real indentation where his stomach is so he's he's got a healthy stomach at the moment which means that him by himself the the, the likelihood of, of him trying to hunt is probably pretty slim but you never know with lions they are incredibly opportunistic we had uh, about maybe about two or three months ago we had an absolutely amazing sighting with his brother who single-handedly attacked and killed a fully grown big male buffalo so this buffalo was down in the Timbavati riverbed and the battle went on for about two or three hours and one male lion probably weighing about 200 kilograms managed to attack and kill a buffalo that was probably around seven or eight hundred kilograms so they've, they've definitely got it in them they just need to choose their time and, and their place ultimately i think a lot of it has got to do with the, the whole conservation of energy and if a male lion, you know, he's got so much more on his plate, he has to patrol his territory, he has to vocalize, he has to chase other males away. And so if the opportunity arises that where he can take a meal from the rest of the pride, he'll happily do so. And so that's why I think they, they tend to not really move around as much, or at least hunt as much as the females do. And when you consider his overall body as well, I mean, that very, very thick mane will make him warm <laughs> quite quickly. So when he's running around, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it, it slows him down a lot. It makes him hotter, so he tends not to be too much more active. And he has moved, or I mean, I, I, I don't actually remember the last time we, we saw him and his brother together. It was probably when that pride of lions was hanging around that big water hole that um, you've probably become quite familiar with in the eastern part of our reserve. And now he's popped up in the, the very southern sections of the reserve. And so him and his brother has, have obviously left the pride and they've split up. And it just is a lot easier to patrol as much of their territory as they possibly can. And they might spend a couple of days apart from one another. And then eventually by calling and roaring, they'll hear each other and then they'll find each other again. I'm sure the movements, you know, we are in the south, but he has been moving slightly further north and hopefully he, he'll find his way towards the rest of the pride in the next couple of days or so. If he keeps walking in this direction, he's going straight into the area where we last had them. <clears throat> See, again, just to, to, to reiterate the, the camouflage that that mane serves, you can see the white body and then you can see the head. So very, very, very camouflage, especially with that mane. And I mean, if, if he was hiding in the long grass, waiting for something to come, he would turn onto his haunches and crouch down. And so none of that white would be exposed. It would just be the, basically that very dark mane that he had. He would drop his head very, very low down. And basically, if anything was walking past, the only thing that they could potentially see is that mane. And at this time of year, you have to have incredibly good eyesight to be able to pick out a, a mane 
when it's so well hidden. I'm surprised. Rob, you're asking the lifespan of a lion in the wild. And with male lions, because of, of the intense life that they lead, because they're needing to take over a pride of lions, because they're needing to protect that pride that they've taken over, they tend to live quite a lot less than females do. And so, I mean, the average lifespan of a male lion in the wild would probably be in the region of 13 to or 10 to 13 years old I would say is, is the maximum I mean from the age of about seven or eight years old is when they're really in their prime and then from there they start to deteriorate they start to get weaker they get older and all of the the taxing activities that they've they've had to do over their lifespan has really started to take a toll over their body with the females because they don't actively defend the territory as much as as the males do they do definitely have to defend their territories when other females come into the area but it isn't nearly as much as these male lions they've also got the help of of their sisters their aunties their, their nieces whatever the, the um, setup of the pride might be and so they they tend to live a little bit longer and uh, a female lion, I think, can potentially live until about maybe 17 or 18 in the wild. There are one or two recordings of lions that might live, or females that might live up until 20 years old, but that's an, an abnormality. They tend to live a lot less than that. It's a very short and action-packed life for these really big cats. You just get to see a little bit of what the the reserve and the weather's doing now. So still very, very, very cloudy, very overcast conditions. So and these, I guess for, by now, I mean, it's it's been light for at least an hour and 45 minutes. So most of the nocturnal animals are probably doing exactly what this male lion is doing now. It's finding a place to settle down for the day. We actually started the morning off trying to find the leopard that Nikki had this yesterday morning. And so we started our morning off by the riverbed and we saw tracks of a, of a male leopard, so probably the same one that he had, and tracks of a female lion walking on the same road. But there was a layer of condensation or, or at least moisture on top of the tracks. And so that was probably from a little bit earlier on in the evening, maybe closer towards 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, somewhere around there. So, I mean, just, just mentioning that with the tracks that we had, we probably are going to leave this male lion now, just because he's not really showing any sign of, of um, moving around or roaring. There's always the opportunity of us to maybe come back here a little bit later on in the afternoon where the, the chances of him moving around and vocalizing are greater. So we'll head back up towards that river system and see if we have any luck with that female lion. Maybe she shows us her cubs this morning, holding thumbs, fingers crossed. But whilst we drive up towards the river there, we'll send you across to Juma where Trishala is waiting for you. We have another roadblock. The elephants have been great to us these last couple of days. Here you go. Where did you even come from? Behind that mound. Hmm? And you've been eating? You can see that her one tusk is actually broken. She looks a little familiar with the break of that tusk looked quite familiar. It's just tough with elephants. You can tell sometimes when a break is really obvious, like or a structure of the ear or injury in the ear or tusk is very obvious, or even trunk. And that one looked familiar. So maybe it's a herd we know. This 
young one here has a cut in its ear, which is something it'll have. There we go. It'll have its whole life, so it'll be something we can identify this animal with. I can't imagine how tasty the dry grass is at the moment. But they're trying to get as much in as possible before it's absolutely scarce. Hello, talking to you. Oh. There's some hyena whooping in the background. Speaking of which, I will go check the den today. Or this morning as well. And then in the afternoon we can kind of establish if there's fresh tracks around. Oh, she's decided to move her den. update the lines are I seem to be moving east quite a bit or have moved east um, so we might may not see them today sorry Lundek I was just listening to the game drive radio there I had a comment that you wanted to feed through Megan, you say you love it when elephants have their sassy pants on. I do too. I think they're a very nice reminder that you can be gentle and compassionate and caring and also a little sassy. Big lovable sass balls. Let's move a little further ahead. I think there's more in front of us. Can't see too much past this mound. Also a whole lot behind us. At least they were. They're all over this block, kind of spread. quite dense as you can see. Now as winter becomes drier and drier, those trees will lose their leaves a lot more, all of these trees. So these dense blocks will actually become much easier to look through. Okay, they're on my left here. Yeah, there's a bit of a clearing. Head. I think that they will make their way towards Bifflesick Dam. We're not too far from it. I am still still have faith in there and some lions, so keep listening out. I'm trying to be a little bit quiet and just listen out. So there's an evoke a male, which is our male coalition of lions. One of them probably dark mane in a buffalo's hook. I miss seeing the males, they're just, I like them so much. But definitely elephants are prized to me too. I think my favorite sightings are with elephants. Debbie, you'd like to know when they get their ears cut, does it bleed a lot? 
that depends on where it gets cut because remember they have a quite a network of blood vessels behind that ear so if they manage to you can actually see on that ear now really thick veins whole network of veins and arteries if they manage to nick one of those yep they're gonna bleed a lot An elephant can pump all of the blood in its body through the ears and back again in 20 minutes. So there's a lot of blood going through there. I heard some good news on the game drive radio, hence my smile. I'm moving right into the middle of this block. So I think that I am going to, since pretty much the lions are off the property and not in the area we can go to. There possibly nobody's found them. The only ones that have been found is the Avoca male that's in Buffalshook. Um, but the rest of the pride are probably Torchwood or Buffalsook. Anyway, I'm going to go around to Buffalsook Dam and see what's going on there, and I'm going to send you over to Steve with a surprise. Thank you, Trishana. Well, I've been working hard this morning, everybody. I've been working very hard, and uh, we found Tandy's tracks. We found Tandy, but uh, before we delve into that. We found her tracks. She led the cub away to where we tracked her last night, back down into the river, to the drainage line, and then her tracks came back up the hill. Um, we just tracked her now to find her, and uh, we found her on foot now. Actually walked in to see the uh, a couple of hyenas on foot. I didn't actually see her on foot, but her tracks came off the road there. Saw two hyenas I knew got to find her as we came in and there she is isn't she beautiful she's a beautiful beautiful cat now I think somewhere nearby here she's got a kill I haven't seen it yet um, but just on the other side of the road where we are nearby is where Trish had the cubs tracks last night with Tundi's tracks and then we found those tracks again but then she took the cubs, the cub all the way back down to the drainage where Tristan first found her. And then we tracked her back up the hill. Oh, such a lovely feeling. I can't explain it, everybody. The feeling that one experiences when they find a leopard through tracking. There's actually an incredible, incredible feeling. Fern Dundee, cha cha cha. Well, there she is. There she is, and um, we're not sure if there is a kill. I'm almost certain there must be a kill by the fact that she, the way she's been moving. But I haven't yet seen it. Um, two hyenas are on the scene, and we had ambulance hyena calling a few minutes before. I don't know if you've ever heard any of us refer to the ambulance hyena. It's got a, <laughs> a call that sounds like an ambulance. It's a very unique hyena call. And that young individual, I don't know who it is. I think it's one of the adults because it's been around since I've been here. It's uh, trying to find the hyenas and the other two that are here ready, because they are selfish, hyenas are very selfish, didn't make a sound. They just went, we're not going to reply. We're not going to reply because we don't. if we do find meat, we're not going to share it. Well, that is awesome. That is a... Uh, Vanna's first leopard with us at Wild Earth. Welcome. <laughs> yes. So, everybody, if you have the time 
and the inclination, please feel free to visit the link below to support us so we can continue to bring you wonderful wild images from the African wilderness. We'd really support that. We'd really enjoy that. I'm sorry, I appreciate that. She looks like she's got a little bit of a belly on her there. I mean, everybody, the purpose, the reason for her moving and then coming back again, you know, she moved the cub and she came back again. There's a kill. There must be. Um, we're going to have to find it. She's probably going to take us to it shortly. She's probably been eating on it. No doubt she probably saw me and decided to move off of it. It's something that she does. Something that leopards do do if they see people on foot. They generally are quite skulky and move away. And then we came in in the vehicle. She's very relaxed with the vehicle. And she might go back to it shortly. But right now, she's just going to do what leopards do best. Another reason, I'm just going to move up here, Vanna. We've got a battalier in the tree up ahead there. Another... Oh, sorry. That was first gear. Another reason. Can you see him up there? Tell me when you're good. Another reason where you know there's a kill around is when there's a battalier like that. And together with two hyenas that are skulking around on the ground. Battalers are the first animals to find meat. Well, in the morning. Hyenas obviously are the best at finding meat by smell. But battalers fly in very low air conditions. So they fly very early in the morning. Now move forward a touch. Just slightly move forward there. <laughs> How's that? That should do. Just get that branch of the marula out the way. Now, when we arrived in here, we smelt something. I mean, it might have been the hyenas. It might have been Tundi. I don't know. This wonderful battalier is normally, they're quite close to the meat. Battaliers as well as uh, tawny eagles are normally a very good indicator of some type of food. But we can't hear the hyenas. I didn't see them. Hopefully, Tundi managed to hoist the kill. Maybe the hyenas found her with it and they stole it. But we didn't hear any noises that hyenas make, that very loud cackling sound they make, especially when there's more than one. There's a dominance hierarchy that they sort of push on each other. Okay, let's go back to our beautiful, beautiful leopard. The battalier is trying not to show us its face. Very good. And forget everybody. We are live, we are interactive, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, comments, you send them through. Okay, so she's grooming. A classic time when you're happy. She's grooming. So the classic sort of idea that she has eaten something. If it was a large impala, she wouldn't have been able to hoist it. But the noises, should I say the lack of noises, to me indicates that uh, she has hoisted. So just wait and see. We've got patience. We've been very patient this morning with our tracking. Spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out where she went to in the river and, uh, and figured out that she definitely wouldn't have been there with her cub. Oh, Tony Tutos. My pleasure, sir. Nice surprise indeed. I'm happy to find her. You all know that we love showing you these cats. We love finding them for you ourselves and we love putting skills to the test and finding lions, everybody. Tracking lions is, is, is doable. You know, it's not the hardest of tracking in the world. It's entry level tracking, but tracking a leopard down, I can tell you that is, that takes some practice and that makes me feel quite good inside. So I'm, I'm quite happy. I'm gonna give myself a pat on the back. Seeing as Tristan's not here, someone has got to pull in the leopard tracks. But there she is, and she's not far from camp. We're only about two, three minutes away. 
The drainage line just below us here is the Rebecca's Fulhamon's cut line drainage line, an area that Lalamba spent six months of her life, four or five months of her life last two years ago. Uh, so it's an area that Tandy is very, very familiar with. And I, I was anticipating her stashing her cub in there. But bear in mind, everybody, this drainage line is less than 400, 500 meters from the Juma Den. They might have moved, but Trish suggested last night they might have moved. But where they've currently been for the last little while is less than half a kilometer, which is very nearby. Okay, well, we've got some spots in the long grass and beyond. Pinder has got some spots of their own. All right, welcome back, everyone. So it seems that it's raining cats today. So we saw some lions and leopards earlier. And now we've got a slightly different cat species, a smaller cat. And he seems to have just disappeared. It is a male cheetah, young male cheetah. Now I have lost him. So I've got to be very careful where we're driving at the moment. There's lots of little stumps in the grass here that is, tends to give us flat tires if we drive over them. So I'm trying to refine this cheetah and not drive over these stumps. He's right next to us. Good spot, Marcel. That's why we have Marcel on the vehicle. I wonder if he's going to go and send Mark up against that tree. See that tree to his left, which is sort of curled over a little bit. Um, I'm not sure exactly which male cheetah this is. It does look like a younger male. So maybe still just too young to be able to scent Mark. Because, you know, with him being younger, he doesn't want to draw too much attention towards himself. Because this is within the area that the two dominant male cheetah of the south do occasionally come around you can see how he's walking on very carefully i wonder if he's picked up on the scent or if he's seen or heard some antelope up ahead this area where we are at the moment does tend to have quite a few impala you can see just walking around slowly doesn't want to make too many noise make sure he's not standing on a branch which could draw any attention towards him sticking to the longer grass which is perfect for his camouflage so what we will do is if we do see that he's busy hunting or is he, if he's definitely spotted something we will just have to watch from a distance we don't want to give his position away we want to give him as much of a chance as well as give the antelope as much of a chance we don't want to benefit either the the cheetah or the prey that he's hunting. Oh, very nervous off-roading here. This area is renowned for giving flat tires and we don't want to get a flat tire close to this cheetah. I'm sure we'll get visual of him soon. It is opening up a little bit up ahead. Fortunately I did drive here earlier. You can see my vehicle track so I know that this track that we drove on should be clear of any little sneaky branches sticking up there he is just in the shade of the tree what a morning and we've got Develt and Liam who were able to find him earlier and let us know that he's around and they're busy doing some filming of their own right he's gonna just walk out in front of us you see how he's dropping his head down as low as he can and then he'll stop and look. He's using all his senses at the moment. He's got a very good sense of hearing, smell. His vision is like he's looking through binoculars. By the way he's walking, he is aware that there is something in this area. You also notice when he drops his head down, he'll even drop his ears to try avoid any sort of breaking of the outline of his silhouette. Adal, you are most certainly correct. This is one very gorgeous boy because he's a younger male as well. He probably hasn't been in a fight yet with any other cheetah, so he has no scarring. 
he's in pristine pristine condition he's still got a little bit of growing to get uh, you can see that he is a young male just looking at the size of him the amount of muscle that he has the height and the lack of scarring on his nose on his ears he's just stopping now to listen there is a slight breeze coming from him towards us and that's why he's walking in that direction using the wind to his advantage looking at his belly it doesn't look like he has eaten recently so the last two or three days maybe he hasn't had a meal so he's very keen now to hunt now I will tell you if he continues in that exact direction that he's walking in now for about a kilometer he's going to walk straight into that area where the lions and the leopards were fighting earlier and that's exactly not what he wants to do it's a little bit worrying but uh, he's very aware and I'm sure if he does get closer towards those lines and the direction that he's heading he will smell them Whew. A crazy morning show me all notice as he's walking he's flicking his head from side to side flicking his tail flicking his ears uh, that herd of buffalo that we saw earlier was not too far from where we are here and you'll often find that buffalo is a track lot of flies and so he's going to be irritated by those flies I wonder if he's spotted something camel pug it's unusual for a male of this age to join up with much older males so a coalition of cheetahs so a group of cheetah generally will consist of males um, that are brothers uh, there have been cases of of single males like this who are young to join up with each other um, i'm not aware of another younger male of around his age in this area so i do suspect that this male may never form a coalition males don't always form coalitions uh, you often see them by themselves but in other areas of the reserve you will see maybe two three and there's even been known to have in different parts of Africa five males in a coalition which would be spectacular to see but those five males are all brothers but right, let's head back towards the road I think he's walking on the road which is good news for me because it means that I don't have to be driving in this area where we always get flat tires oh, that doesn't sound good there's some stumps sticking up there he's just sat in the shade of a tree which helps a little bit more with his camouflage so with the spots that he has on his body um, which will break the outline of his coat and the spots with the shade will just look a little bit like dappled light right there we've got the road that's good news There you can see just up ahead to the left he's just sitting off the road in the shade of that tree now there isn't a water hole too close by so there's not going to be a massive movement of antelope in this area but if he carries on in this direction that he's heading in southwards there's a couple of water holes there and he may know that and that's why he might be heading that way because he knows that that's where all the different types of prey species like Nyala and Impala that I'll be hunting. How oh, fantastic, such a slender body. Right, so from one slender animal to another, let's go head over to Tswalu and see what the meerkats are up to. So they've just started coming out. It's very, very late this morning. Um, just that's because of this wind. I mean, your ambient temperature is not too bad. I think it was like nine or 10 degrees this morning. And now we're probably sitting at 15, 16 degrees. But just this wind drops the temperature with the wind chill factor. So they've just started coming out. Um, Meerkat have that um, they're sitting with one of the other groups that's not as relaxed as these, um, but they say those ones are actually still in bed. Um, and remember an animal this size a little mammal this size it loses heat very very rapidly because they got this 
very big surface area relative to body mass so that heat transfer from them from going from a high temperature to low low temperature which is the air happens very very rapidly and that means there's a third one out now as well that means they can they, they're losing a and a fourth one so now they're all out so that means they lose energy super 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 fast um, so what I'm curious about now is if that number fifth meerkat, that number five, has actually joined up with this group, yes or no. I don't think he would have, but it'll just be interesting to see. And as as we mentioned the other day, Jean and I, we're gonna we're not gonna spend all our time with this group of meerkats. You know, we just want to give them a little bit of space. Um, so we'll kind of maybe do it like every second day, but uh, but Rebecca will. Be keeping an, a close eye on them so if there's any interesting developments whatsoever um, she'll keep us posted and then we can uh, then we can join in so we won't be missing out on anything oh you can see they're kind of like still hunkered down they're trying to keep like the, getting some sun now Adele you spot on there they <clears throat> they are you can still see just their body posture and everything, you know, they're like hunkering down still just inside those bars. They are very cold. Um, but unfortunately for them, there's a lot colder weather actually moving in um, from Thursday onwards. It's, then we're going to be hitting really cold temperatures over with a maximum, I think, of 10 degrees centigrade, and that's without the wind chill factor. So we're going to be we're going to be dropping well below that as a maximum with strong winds. Um, so yeah, feel for the meerkats and feel for Jandra and myself. We're going to be empathising with the meerkats over that time. Just look at them sitting in a row there; it's sweeter. So interestingly, talking about the temperature and looking at these meerkats and body size the other other thing to remember is if you're living in an environment that is consistently cold like the arctic or the antarctic yeah well have a super dense coat of fur and you can stay nice and warm um, but these little guys they don't have particularly dense coats and in fact even on their chest it's very very sparsely um you know it's got very sparse hair on the chest and one of the key things about that is that the environment that they live in is prone to extremely hot temperatures and extremely cold temperatures. So they need to get that balance of a coat that kind of keeps them warm, but also kind of keeps them cool. So they're relying not just on their, on their fur to do that, they're relying in a huge way on behavioral adaptations. So getting down into the entrance of the burrow, um, you'll sometimes see, and those of you have been fortunate enough to, to actually see meerkats in the wild, and even on even on on film and that, you'll you'll see that they'll do a lot of what we call dust bathing or sand bathing, and you know, that often gets punted as oh it helps with parasites and that. But what actually happens there is you'll see meerkats will often lie in the sand, and sometimes they'll actually scrape the sand beforehand. Um, my dog at home actually does it as well. So she'll go scrape the sand and then lie down with her belly. And what you what you find is that when it's very hot, they will do that. They'll scrape the top layer of sand away and then lie down with their stomach on that. So that's slightly cooler layer underneath. And they can actually dump body heat from themselves into that cooler sand. Um, so they use, you know, so it's not just about the fur and that, you know, the physical adaptations. Behavioral adaptations are crucially important in terms of uh, maintaining a constant body temperature or a body temperature not so much being constant but kept kept within a certain range that enables them to function and that that body temperature is directly related to energy loss and energy gain I mean that's really what all these systems are going about sorry Adina if I understood that correct or if I heard that um, question correctly why do meerkats stand up do not stand up while they while they're walking um I, i'm not sure if i got that correction but oh we say why do they stand up when not walking okay so this is for vigilance so they actually need to stand up because then they get a better view that's number one in other words 
when when they when they're walking around, they're like this high. When they're standing up, they're that high. So that that even that small difference makes a huge difference in terms of their field of view for looking out for predators. But like they're sitting now, the key thing that they're doing there by stand, sitting up like that or standing up like that is actually warming themselves. So they're facing the sun. They're getting the lovely warm sun rays on their on their on their stomach, their chest, and their bellies. Um, with, and remember I said just now that they've got very, very sparse hair on their chest and their skin is also a dark grey colour on their chest. So that actually enables them to warm up really, really quickly. So those are your two key reasons for them standing up like that, is for being able to see better as well as or having a better field of view as well as um, getting, higher getting a warmer body temperature faster. So we're just going to stick here for a little while, and um, but in the meantime, head over to Steve and Juma and see what they got that side. Thanks, Dylan. Well, we are still with the beautiful Tandy, and she's behind a very small bit of grass there. She's done a bit of grooming. Oh, she's breathing quite heavily. Got a bit of a belly on her there. There's been no movement. We haven't heard the hyenas, haven't seen them again. So just a bit of a tip there for all of you um, aspiring trackers. If you're tracking a leopard and you, you find hyenas in an area that you are really suspecting the leopard to be, there's a very, very good chance, that, <laughs> almost 100% chance, that that leopard is nearby, or the kill at least is nearby. Many leopards are quite skittish on foot, as many trackers will know. And they will always see you before you see them. That's why when we find a situation like that, it's almost a confirmed sighting of a leopard. We can then access that area off-road and we'll go off-road. It's the same as if we've got Tundi and her cub tracks going into a bush or a drainage line and we go around the other side, they don't come out. You don't walk in there. That's a very, very big no-no. Don't walk into an area that a leopard and lion, or leopard or lion with their cubs have gone into and not come out. It means that they're in that bush. And if you can access it, do so with the car. Don't try and go in there on foot because mums can be very protective. Many of you mums out there going, yes, we can, Steve. You're so right about that. You never stand between a mum and their children and their kids. I'm just hoping that Tandy's had enough to eat and she's going to take us to her little boy. We followed his tracks down the road with her and we actually found the way he had a little poo. <laughs> and the poo looked like there was blood in it. It was a little one. So I think he's eating some meat. Hello, Leo, age six. Well, how often do leopards need to eat? Well, Leo, leopards will eat two, three times a day, four times a day, even five times a day if they've got a kill. But they can go for over two weeks or up to two weeks without eating. Doesn't mean that they do that. Um, sometimes you can find a leopard catching more than one animal at a time. Um, they're very opportunistic. They will hunt whenever they can, even if they're full. If the energy is available, they will try to catch some food. But they go through these periods of eating and resting eating and resting with some cleaning in between and Tandy is a very very good hunter okay let's quickly send you over to a fast cat in and beyond Pinda on the move right so this male cheetah is still on the move at the moment looks like he's definitely hunting there was a herd of impala in this area a little bit earlier. So I think he's heading in the direction where we saw the impala. He may have heard them. Those in part open up their head. Oh, 
All right, I do apologize for the technical issues. We are in an area where the signal is poor. It is part of being in the African bush, as far away from technology as possible. So I was saying earlier that there was a herd of impalas up ahead. And I think you might have heard the ox peckers on the back of those impalas while they were busy chirping away. And that's something that would catch his attention because he knows ox peckers love to feed on impala. Yes, we see them on buffalo and, and rhinos, which he doesn't feed on, but they do feed on some of the other antelope as well. Right, so I think he's just around the bush. Let's see where he's off to. Should open up nicely up ahead, although the grass is a little bit long here, which is completely to his favor. Longer grass just means easier to hunt means that when he stalks he can stalk and get much closer to those impala right I do have him off to my left here so we're just gonna loop up ahead we are on the road at the moment and I'll just dip off the road and we should have a good view coming through here so Jace it depends on um, the mothers so you'll find different mothers tend to kick their cubs out differently as well as you'll find that, oh, he's going to walk into the road. You'll find that males tend to be kicked out a little bit later than females. Uh, but on average, you're looking at about 20 months to about two years when the mothers will kick their cubs out and then they'll look to have new little cubs. Right, he's going to walk in the road. I'm just going to reverse back just to give him some space. I don't want to block his movement here. See if he's going to walk past us. No, he's going to go off the road again. I think he knows that if he's walking on the road, he's a little bit more exposed. It's quite open when walking on the road. And when hunting, you do not want to be exposed. You want to use your camouflage and your surrounding habitat as much to your advantage. You'll notice that he just doesn't walk and walk and walk and walk. That would be a waste of energy and would potentially get him caught out. He'll stop and pause every two minutes or three minutes or so just to give him an opportunity to listen, smell, look around because if he walks aimlessly there's quite a good chance that he may not see some prey species up ahead and he just gives his position away. Right, let's turn around. Whoop, hold on everyone, it is a little bit bumpy here. Andrew, you'll often find that brothers will stick together and so they do interact uh, but normally if there's maybe a female that they're hoping to mate with but for most parts they leave each other alone and then unfortunately if their sister does have cubs um, and they feel that those cubs could potentially be a threat to them later on in life they will attack those cubs and so the sister would defend the cubs and then so they would interact in that way and then if they come across their sister and she's made a kill they will chase their sister off um, there have been cases where males have shared kills with siblings but that's very very rare for most parts they will chase the sibling off and feed right you should get a good view of him up ahead here he was walking this direction I think he's just taking this opportunity to rest yep there he is just to our right see while he's walking around he's got his head down busy smelling um, he's not aware if there are other males in this area he won't be too concerned about females but he will be because all the males on Pinder are older than this male he's the youngest of the males who have uh, are independent <laughs> Seems like this cheetah is busy playing hide and seek with us. Alright, so while we wait for him to move into an area where it's easier to follow and easier to view, I think let's head over to Dylan with some meerkats. There goes over there. So, this is Mosadi that's closest to us here. Um, and unfortunately, still 
no sign whatsoever of the two missing sub-adults. Um, so I think Jandre and I, we are in total agreement that uh, I think the badger did what badgers do and uh, probably actually managed to get hold of those pups and those, those sub-adults. Um, again, we're not 100% sure of it, but we're just going on kind of like circumstantial evidence here and the fact that she's made no effort now to get back to the other burrow system when they go foraging out they're not leaving a babysitter behind which tells you that they you know those pups all were almost certainly taken by the by the honey badger um you know we were thinking or well, maybe wait till the end of this week but you know just even the fact that our mechat habituates has been going out and she's seen zero sign of any kind of babysitting activity no movement from this group apart from their little foraging um, excursions from this burrow system so that's quite sad um but yeah it's it's not all bad you know there's a the alpha male's still here she's still here um the other sub adults so yeah this is this is a very very slow very cohesive meerkat family and certainly what's happened is nothing unusual in meerkat societies um and we we've touched on the the benefits or well, the importance should i say of predation over the past couple of weeks um in, in every now and again and you know predation is part and parcel of a meerkat family's existence you know it's not something that they oh well geez we never saw that one coming kind of thing it was like yep honey badgers are part of this environment eagles are part of this environment leopards caracal jackal um snakes you know, these are all very very real um threats to any meerkat family regardless of the size of the group um you know so they'll you know they don't they'll carry on with their their meerkat lives i guess and it's you know for, for genre and myself as well seeing this kind of behavior and having you all share it with us is, is part of it you know there's um there's the ups and downs of any any safari experience and this is absolutely no different whatsoever. The big question now is to see how this group performs. Uh, sorry, Pablo, um, just asked a question. I didn't get it properly. If, if that can just please be repeated. Ah, Pablo, thank you for that question. Do meerkats hibernate in winter? Um, no, they don't. Uh, certainly in our region, we've got no species, to my knowledge, that actually exhibit true hibernation. If you look at a lot of the reptiles, uh, and I'm talking, I'm referring specifically now to snakes here, they can go through extended periods of inactivity. Um, in the cooler winter months but even even in midwinter at Swalu you know if you get uh, a slightly warmer day those snakes will actually come out and bask at the entrance of burrows or if they if they you know sleeping in the hollow of a tree that kind of stuff so we've got no examples of animals that truly hibernate and definitely not meerkats you now these little guys they, they you know they, they they're burning a lot of energy they so they'll go down the burrows. They, 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 being in the burrows, there's a very, very nice ambient temperature down there from, you know, from anything between 30 and 50 centimeters underground. Their temperature is very, very stable um, between summer and winter. Um, the food that they're eating is very high energy. Scorpions, geckos, um, worms, you know, all sorts of little things like that. So they're getting high energy food. They, they've got the ability to pop in and out of burrows as they need when they're foraging. Um, so no, the meerkats don't hibernate. Another interesting feature about them, just, just while we're talking about things going underground. Apologies, sorry, I've got quite a bit of wind on my comms here today, but um, the question, so I didn't get it who it was from, but the question was, are these burrows interconnected underground? Um, and yes and no. So at any of these burrow systems, 
there are multiple entrances, as you've as you've seen as you as you've seen on these ones here. But not all of them are interconnected. Some of them are, some of them aren't. And I think a large part of that has got to do with the age of individual burrows. So you would assume that the burrows in the centre are probably the older burrows, and then the as the burrow system starts expanding, so that, so the whether it's ground squirrels digging them or meerkats kind of adding on and modifying them, the burrows on the outside would be the younger ones. And I would imagine that there's probably a greater likelihood, and I've got nothing to base this on, I'm just, you know, it's pure speculation. I would imagine that there's probably a greater chance that the burrows in the centre are have got more connections underground than the ones on the outside. Um, that being said, at the island burrow system that, that uh, Mossadi and her group were at originally when we started with them, um, that burrow system, there were three entrances at least that were right on the perimeter that were definitely connected underground because you'd watch one going down and then two popping out the burrow, the, the burrow entrance next to it. So yes, uh, you know, some of these burrows are connected underground, but definitely not all of them within the system. I was going to mention just now, to, speaking of burrows and going underground, um, one of the ways that they prevent sand getting in the eyes is they've got what we call a nictitating membrane. So they've got this essentially a third eyelid that can actually protect the eyes when they go underground. And very occasionally, it's actually sometimes easier to see on photographs or very, very slow motion uh, filming. You'll get this, this film that crosses the eye sideways as opposed to up and down. And that actually helps sand getting, getting into the eye. Get a little one scratching there. So we're just gonna bide our time with them. Oh, there's a secretary bird, holy mackerel. Okay, it's miles away. We're gonna see if we can get a, a view of a secretary. It's very far away. But in the meantime, head over to Ngala and Jandra and I will try for the secretary bird. Okay. Welcome back to Anbio and Ngala. We've just seen this beautiful elephant bull walking straight towards us and we thought it was too good not to share. See, he's even got a, a very, very chipped tusk. But what we've been very interested in is, is he walks straight up to a knob thorn tree, which are basically the tallest trees that we, you can see in the background there. And he started testing to see the strength of it. So he killed his, his trunk up above his head and he started pushing up against it. And Owen and I got so excited. We really, really thought that it, it was going to try and push one of the trees over. It tested it and it didn't really give too much. And so it just decided to move on and now it's settled for a much smaller tree. But those tusks, or at least the one on the right hand side, is really nice. It's got quite a lot of girth to it whereas this one here on the left hand side the one that we're seeing is completely broken off basically and so that could have been in in a fight he is walking straight towards another knob thorn i might just try and move forward if he does threaten to push it over it doesn't look like he's moving straight towards it though no oh, he's just teasing us <laughs> but as he crosses over, look at the, uh, about halfway through his back, he's got a whole bunch of debris that he obviously flung over in an attempt to dust bath himself, and that's what's left behind. I think we'll be able to get another good view of him if I just reverse back slightly. So, it's just something about, I mentioned like the, how male lions have got a presence when you see them. I think in many ways elephants have got a, an even greater presence. Ooh, we've got a nice gap here. Look, he's smelling the air. Trunk is up. Oh, I love it when those elephants pick up their trunks like that. And the direction that he's heading to is straight down towards the river. And in that river, the vegetation is still nice and lush. It's very, very green. And so it has been attracting a lot of herds recently. And, and that smell might have just been trying to pick up the scent of, of females in the area. Try and move around. It's making us mission a little bit, but always worth watching him. Yeah, 
So this is probably going to be the last view we have of him. You can see he's, he's slowly feeding, but he's not stopping. He's taking bites out, which means that he is probably trying to get down to that riverbed for other females. So whilst we let him be and carry on with our morning, we're going to send you across to Pinda, where Jared has got something nice for you. So this male's just rested now up on a bit of an old termite mound and the reason why he stopped walking around is that he spotted or we can see at least one impala up ahead and so I think he's just sitting and waiting to see what that impala is going to do. I don't think that impala has seen him yet. We haven't heard any alarm calls. It is busy feeding at the moment. I can't see it anymore. The grass is a bit long. He's looking this way. So Marcel can see it better than I can. Um, it is busy ruminating apparently. I have no visual of this impala. Uh, but the fact that he's ruminating is probably a sign that he isn't aware of this cheetah. And he just happens to be facing this direction. The sun is coming from this way. So maybe he's just warming up in the sun and busy chewing on the cud. And this male cheetah is waiting to see his move. Now you'll notice that between this cheetah and the impala the grass is quite short so if he had to get up and start to stalk in that direction he may be seen so i think that he's just sitting and waiting and hoping that maybe that impala does move into this direction now you'll notice what the cheetah is doing is that while it's looking at the impala it's pinning its ears straight backwards so this is causing two sort of purposes one by pinning its ears down um, hopefully the impala won't see its ears but its ears are pointing backwards because it wants to hear if anything comes up from behind it's really open up ahead and so the cheetah is not worried about being surprised by a predator up ahead but it is listening to what's behind it in case a lion or a leopard or hyena comes into this direction or even if an impala walks up behind it it will hear the breaking of the branch or maybe the chewing of an impala and it will turn around and have a look at what's made that noise so it's using what I like to call a bit of 360 degree awareness. Looking up ahead, can see what's ahead, listening to what's behind, can hear what is behind. Now the one problem that this cheetah is going to have is with these flies landing on its ears. You'll notice that the ears are flicking from side to side. And even that small movement of the flicking of the ears could attract the attention of that impala. Um, although the cheetah is very well camouflaged and it has been in a bit of shade and there's a little bit of grass around it that impala will see will see the ears flicking from side to side oh it's just heard something off to the left so butterfly you're saying that the cheetah does look like it's about to pounce pounce um actually not so that impala is way too far away for this cheetah to even think about pouncing or at least running after the impala at the moment but what it is doing is it's getting into the position ready. So if that impala does walk this way, it doesn't have to shuffle its body into the position where it's going to take off. It's basically in the starting position at the moment. And if that impala does walk into the range where this cheetah feels like it's time to go, it can go without having to shuffle into that position. So it is just waiting patiently. This is a waiting game. It could sit here for hours, not moving too much, waiting for that impala to walk this way. So Marcel, I'm not sure, can you see, is it a male or female impala? I haven't been able to see, I can just see the rear end of the impala at the moment. I just, just saw the impala face. Maybe so if it's a male, it means that it could only be one impala. Impalas are territorial and they have small little patches, so this could be his territory. Yep, um, although male impalas do also stay in bachelor herds, and if it's a female impala, it means that there could be more impala around. All right, so if something spooked that impala, just bolted off to the right. You can see how the, the smell cheetah's just lifted his head a little bit to see where that impala's gone to. Now it's out of sight, so the cheetah knows that it, if it can't see the impala, the impala cannot see him, and that's why he's just stood up a little bit to try to see with him too. And I wonder if he's going to follow the impala. The wind isn't 100% in his favor but you might find that he will position himself so that he's downwind. But then 
Impala isn't alarm calling, so that should be a sign that the Impala hasn't seen him and maybe something else just spooked the Impala. Sometimes you'll find that birds will flat out of the grass and just give them a bit of a fright. The grass is long there, so it may have run about five meters and stopped, but we can't see it. Shadika, no, an Impala's eyesight isn't better than that of a cheetah. Um, I don't know if you've ever used binoculars, Shadika, but um, the cheetah has vision almost like that of binoculars. They're able to really focus in into um, something from quite a far distance away and, and their ability to pick up movement is also really good. I think where the Impala has an advantage is that, um, just like I said with the cheetah, their ability to pick up movement, that's what the Impala will look out for. That little bit of movement, the flick of the ear, the flick of the tail, just the cheetah taking a step forward would be enough to gain the attention of this Impala. Right. So he can't see the Impala anymore, so he knows he can move straight to the direction where that Impala is, and then the Impala won't see him. So he's using this time to his advantage to get to that long grass that's between him and the Impala, and then maybe he will stalk and try to get a little bit closer before he runs. So we're going to keep a bit of a distance. I don't want to cause that Impala to look this way. You see how he went straight for the shape. Oh, the Impala, I think, has just seen him. Let's listen. There we go. Can you hear that? So I don't know if they've smelt him or seen him. I think he was a little bit too eager. He ran a little bit too quickly and gave his position away. It's incredible. We can't see the Impala. So the Impala must just be able to see through that long grass to be able to see him. And I think I don't think he was aware that it was a herd. I can see that now there's quite a few Impala around. Now that they've started alarming. So he was focusing just on that one Impala. And there's some more Impala that are alarming to his left. I don't think he knew about so when he ran into the open he didn't see them so he thought ah they can't see me let's see if they alarm again now it's not a very rapid alarm so I wonder if they've smelt him and instead of seeing him often when Impala smell a predator they'll alarm once or twice and then stop but if they see the predator or if they see this cheetah, they're going to start alarming rapidly and all of them together. Doesn't look like they've run off. So if this cheetah does well, he'll just sit and wait and then hopefully the Impala will forget that he was around and that'll give him another opportunity to have a second attempt and busy hunting them. So while we sit and wait to see what unfolds here between the, this cheetah and the impala, apparently the leopard that Steve has is busy moving. Sorry about that, everybody. She's just behind our car. She's uh, she is busy. She just had a poo. Sorry that she's behind the car. Let me turn all the way around here. And uh, I've got some a good feeling about the movement she's doing here. She keeps looking back into that direction. Looking back into the direction where the hyenas were. But this is the road where she moved up and down on. And that's where we tracked her to find her. So she... We think deposited a cub here last night and very nearby and then went to go and collect it and came back. I think she made a kill as well, but I don't know. See how she keeps looking towards where the hyenas are? It's possible there's even another leopard in the sighting that we haven't seen or come across. That would probably give her a little bit of sort of uh, be a little bit tentative, but also hyenas on the ground. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Moi noi, she does seem to have a full tummy and um, that is the third poo in a very short space of time. Not that we saw her have any of the other poos, but the other ones were quite, whoo, 
You don't want to smell it, I can guarantee you that. Okay, she's going directly in to where we tracked her. Let's see if I can see her. Don't give us the slip, Tandy. We don't want you to slip. I don't see her, do you? Yeah, she's just here. She's going right back towards where we saw her initially with those hyena. She's going to come around, actually. Tell me when you're good. Right there. Okay, so she's approaching this very tentatively as if there's, in my opinion, there's another leopard in the sighting. Um, but also, she might not want to sort of interact with the hyenas. But she's also moving very lethargically. I don't know if you know what I mean, but she got up and she's just been like sort of dragging herself. Maybe it's because she's so full. I don't know. But her belly has been freshly suckled. The fur seems a little bit moist. Oh, right above her, in the tree. That's where the kill is. Can you believe it? Can you believe it in this little apple leaf? That is the stomach. Tundi, you are a machine. <laughs> I only noticed because she looked straight up at it. So, look how she's hidden at this little kill. That is the stomach hanging there. Can you see that? Look at that stomach hanging right there. And I can't tell yet what it is. It's an antelope of sorts. I can just see a bit of fur. Let me move up a bit. Maybe we'll be able to get a look at the, or maybe she's gonna go up. Go back slightly. If she goes up, oh, she's gonna go. Ready, she's on the ground. Oh no, she's not gonna go. She's having another poo. Tandy, how can you have another poo already? She's going, she's gonna go. She's gonna go, let's just move up. Oh. Golly gosh, there she is, in the tree everybody. Now Tandy, what on earth kind of a tree is that to put your kill in? <laughs> what a champion. Now everybody, if you're driving past here, you would not even see the leopard in that tree. And we're only 30 meters from the road here. Only 30 meters from the road. And when we tracked her, a little strange culvert that we walked in just over here. I was just by that tree. So I have no doubt that she saw me. And that's probably why she moved off those 30, 40 meters. We saw the hyenas walking away from this tree. And uh, there we go. The very efficient hunter, Huntress Tandy. There's probably a good chance that this was already here last night. still can't quite make out what kill it is. So I'm going to move a little bit to the right, Shavana. That's right, right here. Maybe we'll get a look at her face. But whatever it is, it's a young-ish small animal. It, either it's a daker or it's a small baby something. Sunday's going to move it. It is a daker. It's a male daker. Okay, well, we're going to try and stay here with Tandy. Meantime, let's send you over to Ambion and Gala. She's got a baby giraffe. Yeah, so we might not be here for too long. I know there's lots of exciting things happening on other reserves, but we just came across this really, really tiny giraffe, and we thought we, we'd have to share it with you. And just look at the way that it's walking. The back legs aren't very strong. It's wobbly. And if you go from the back legs to the, to the stomach, look at that umbilical cord in there right next to the mother. Look at the size of it. It is tiny. It's only probably only a, a day or two old, and look, the mother's giving it some tender love. It's actually drinking now, which is really, really cool. It was absolutely so small, and what drew our, our attention to this giraffe was the mother. The mother was being very, very alert, and she was staring dead still in one spot, 
and we went to go and investigate to see if it might have been a, a predator of some sort. But it just turns out that she's got a super young baby giraffe and so she's just watching like a hawk. She's making sure that nothing comes close enough to cause a threat to it. I'd love for that giraffe to, to pick up its head and, and show you. I'd, so <laughs> we, we noticed that the, the ossicones or the horns on top of the youngster's head uh, haven't fused to the skull yet. So they're growing, they're growing upright at the moment, but they're in different angles, which gives it quite a lot of character to the face. You see that? <laughs> So, I mean, now that it's, it's stopped and it's suckling, this giraffe could be here for a while. And so we'll stick around and see if we can get one or two more views. But in the meantime, we'll send you across to Trishala, who's with a nice herd of elephants. Suckling sounds great. That was what I was expecting to see here at the hyena den. Instead... We have a herd of Ellies that have been all over the mound. So I think we can be quite sure that Reuben has moved her cubs. Either that or they're inside shaking in their boots. But I doubt it. We've come three times now. I have seen a few tracks. I don't think they're in this mound. Also, the smell of the hyenas, the elephants wouldn't have liked that. So I guess we know what our mission is for this afternoon, and that would be to go around and check the other den sites that have been used by our Juma clan. See if we can find a ribbon and her cubs again. Well, this was quite a surprise, I must admit. They were all over that mound. This one almost put its foot into that mound. It was quite comical when I arrived. Hi there. Are you enjoying the smell of hyena around it? Clearly not very strong. Now all along this, this mound there's a sandpaper raisin, a raisin bush which elephants absolutely love. And I suppose it was about time that they came along to go I'm actually going to check along this little two track that runs between Philemon's Cutline and Treehouse Dam because there were a number of other mounds that could be used as dens so I'm going to check those out I have checked the one that's a little bit further east of this den I didn't see any tracks or, or scrapes or little wet patches, so I don't think that one's active either. I've been getting good ellies though, and been derailed by many a leopard track all over the place. Anushka, you'd like to know where I think Ribbon has moved her cubs? Which den? I think... I mean, there's a number of possibilities. But I did hear whooping when we were in the east. And there is Gwen's old den in the east. On the 
fire break, so I want to check that out. Um, I'm going to check a galaxy. I'm going to check Aubrey's. I checked the ones that are along here. I didn't see didn't see any activity. But yeah, we're just going to have to keep on looking. Yay! Steve has a hyena that's that's uh, now come to Tandy's kill, so let's go over and see who it is. Yes, well, we have indeed have a hyena over here. There's two places you normally can find hyenas. One is at the den, and the other is at a leopard kill. And here we go. I don't know who this is. It's one of the boys, I think. Just there, chilling. Just arrived. <laughs> so it's going to wait it out and hope that the stomach of Tundi's kill drops. Now, Tundi's gone full camo. Full camo. There she is. There's the stomach hanging down at the bottom. And it is indeed a male dacre that has been caught and hoisted up at this very small yet leafy apple leaf. So I've no doubt that we would have driven past this quite easily. We were looking, I was almost certain there was a kill. We were looking at all the big marula trees, all the big trees, and uh, lo and behold, here we go. Here she is. Hello, beautiful. She's trying to get comfortable with a full belly and a very ungainly tree. Oh, here we go. My Dacre. No one else's Dacre but hers. So she must have made the kill oh, of this Dacre last night and then decided, because obviously the, the hyenas are going to come and uh, the cub wouldn't have been very secure in this area, she decided to take it back to an area of familiarity and then she returned. So that's what the tracks told us. We read them and we found her. So I'm very excited about that. And there's still a little bit of meat on this Dacre. Oh, look at that. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. There's a little bit of meat left. So she might be here this afternoon. Uh, she might also go to her cub at some stage. So her lethargic walking around was one of a food coma. And actually looking on the ground. Can you see on the ground there? Anna, there's some fur that's been plucked. A little bit further down, a little bit on the left there, up, there we go, there's the fur. On the right hand side, there's some fur just there on the middle of the screen. Okay, very good. So the leopards like to pluck their food before eating it. So here we go, there's a Tandy in the tree. She's now sleeping on her kill because that's what she does, she likes it her kill as a pillow and don't forget everybody if you do have the time and the inclination feel free please to go to the link below and support us any donations are most welcome we really do appreciate that bringing you wonderful wild images from the african wilderness You want to know why they hide their kill in a tree? Well, it's not necessarily being hidden in the tree. This one's being hidden, of course, because the tree doesn't really allow it to be seen. But if we have a look at this individual on the ground in front of us on the right, Harry, you want to know why leopards will take the kill up a tree? It's because of these fellows. Now, hyenas will pick up the smell of a leopard kill very quickly, and they will come and steal it. And that hyena, most hyenas are for the most part, more powerful and have a stronger bite force than a female leopard. And they will, if it kills on the ground, have the potential to steal it. Now, every hyena is different. Every hyena has a different relationship with each leopard. But leopards have evolved to take their kills up trees. A leopard can't consume an entire dacre or an impala in one sitting. 
So if they want to look after it and keep it so that they don't have to hunt, because every time they hunt is energy. So if they're able to take a kill up a tree and feed it for two, three days, uh, that means that they save themselves a lot of energy. Whereas if it's on the ground, like what happens with cheetah, cheetah never hoist their kill. Cheetah quite often have a kill for 15 minutes, maybe an hour, and it gets stolen all the time. Uh, cheetah are very unlucky with regards to that, and that's why they have to hunt more. That's why they've become very specialist hunters, because um, they need to eat. Leopard speciality is also stealing, but the ability to take it up a tree. That also protects it against lions, but in this case, a lion would probably be able to grab at this. But if a lion came along, Tundi would just disappear. She would vanish. She might go right to the top of this apple leaf tree or she might run away because she knows that she'll have a big, very hard time against a lion. But at two meters off the ground, hyena's got no chance. But this hyena's being very patient because it knows when she starts feeding again, the daker's going to start breaking up in that stomach or any other part that might fall down. The hyena will thoroughly enjoy breakfast of champions. Now, you can't smell it from where you are, but where we're sitting, the smell of this kill is quite something. And that hyena would have picked that smell up. And that's generally how they find kills. Many of the hyenas we have here actually smell and track our leopards with their nose. I wish I had a nose like hyena to track the leopards. I wouldn't have to look at the tracks and at the ground as much. But I don't. I don't have a nose like a hyena so we have to use our eyes that's okay when you're right behind a leopard you can actually smell them a lion a leopard or a hyena that's been lying on the ground if you smell it it's got a very bad smell this is the patience game now this hyena will hear the fall of something on the ground and it will jump up and snatch it up Hello you, Laurie. The leopards sometimes use the same tree. It all depends on where they are. Um, they generally have specific trees that they choose, like barula trees are, are ideal trees for leopards. Um, it's just there's lots of room and lots of space, um, but many, many trees are utilized, but it's generally the closest acceptable tree is chosen. Now, this tree here is okay. It's um, not the tree I would have thought she would have chosen, but I mean, with the Daka, she could have dragged it a little bit further away. With a bigger kill, or a bigger animal, like a female impala, <clears throat> it requires a lot of energy to drag it somewhere. But it's generally the closest acceptable tree. Like, you don't find them going up knob thorns. Knob thorns are inaccessible. Or buffalo thorns. The thorns themselves make it very difficult to get up. So they don't choose those. So generally nice, comfortable trees in summer they often use nice shady trees but a tree that they can easily climb up that's high enough to get away from from hyenas and also lions lions struggle to climb up big tall trees it's not necessarily the going up but the coming down but you know sometimes we find tundi in the same tree but one of the things that's quite interesting is once you've seen a leopard with a kill in one tree you always look in that tree to see if they're back there again so I'm going to look at this tree very differently. Okay, well, leopards go up trees to keep themselves safe and the meerkats like to go under the ground. So it's still very nippy out here and the wind is definitely not abating at all. It's actually picking up somewhat. Um, but these meerkats have been sunning themselves the whole time now, doing very, very little burrow maintenance. And it seems they're about to head out foraging. The one sitting closest to Jondre now, at about six, seven yards, was just starting to scratch in the ground over there. So they're very, very close, I think, to moving off. But still super alert. There's something, and I don't know what it is, we can't see, we've tried to see. There's something down towards the south in the direction that those two are looking. 
Musadi, that one that's just turned her head facing Jandre now, that's the adult female. And we had a very super brief glimpse of a secretary bird in the far distance. We tried to get another sighting, but we couldn't, unfortunately. So they wouldn't pose a threat to meerkats. You know, it's not impossible that they could catch a youngster if it was out in the open, but very, very, very unlikely. And I think it would be a very slow, very, yeah, very silly, unobservant meerkat that got caught by a, a secretary bird. You know, the biggest, biggest threat in terms of birds is oh, aerial raptors. So birds actually swooping in and catching them like that. Oh, nice to see that grooming going on there. Again, just reaffirming the different, the social bonding, as well as keeping each other's coats clean in areas that they can't really get to easily. So what we've seen, and again, maybe it's purely anecdotal, is that we've been seeing a lot more of this uh, social grooming going on since the, the, what we call the badger incident, and that they've moved down to this burrow system over here. Um, whereas prior to that, there was a tiny bit of it, but very, very little. Um, but once that whole badger incident taken place and they relocated down here, every morning we're seeing this. You know, they're coming out, there's like really social, important social bonding going on there. So you wonder, you know, if that if that badger incident sparked any kind of like, all right, guys, well, let's stick together as a group. Let's, you know, this is very, very important. But again, it's difficult to read too much into it from a, you know, you kind of anthropomorphize animals and you kind of like project what our feelings are onto them. And it's really wrong to do that. I know it's like, like all cute and cuddly and that. And, but, you know, you've got to look at it from an evolutionary perspective and say, well, what are the benefits of doing that as opposed to what are the, the benefits or negatives of not doing it? But they're slowly going to move. They're going to move away from the burrow soon. So Anushka has just asked a question: Do meerkats dust bathe daily? And if you had a follow a group of meerkats, you would see them probably see them dust bathing almost every single day. It's a lot more noticeable in the summer months when it's very very hot. Um, we were chatting earlier about it, and uh, some of you may have uh, been on already then, when we were talking about the importance of dust bathing um, in terms of temperature regulation, um, where if it's very, very hot, they'll actually scrape a bit of sand away and then lie down with their, their bellies um, in the cool sand. And you can see how sparse the fur is on the bellies. So by putting their, you're scraping away that hot layer, even if it's in the shade of bushes, I'll scrape away that hot layer of sand and then spread out, stretch out with their bellies on that cool sand to dump heat. Um, yeah, so dust bathing can take place at any time, but you see it particularly uh, prevalent during the very hot summer months. See how they slowly move further and further away from the burrow. So they started off kind of in the center here, and now they're like right on the edge of the main burrow system at these burrows right on the edge and there's one even further across to Jandre's right now that's that's part of the burrow system but it can almost be termed a bolt hole and again we took a bet this morning as to which direction they went they were going to go and we were both wrong Again, I really apologize. I've got a lot of wind on my mic here. I, d I didn't get the name, but I got the question is, how do meerkats choose who's on sentry duty? Corbett, so, <laughs> sorry, I'm breaking up there, but yeah, yeah, okay. So I think it's, okay, so what, what happens with meerkats is that you you typically find, okay, and there are, you know, there'll always be variations to the rule. You typically find that if she's got pups, Okay, you'll get a babysitter that get left, gets left behind, and that tends to be a sub-adult female. Okay, that tends to be a sub-adult female, but not all. Obviously, if there's no sub-adult females in the group, 
well, then she's left with limited options as to who can get, get to stay behind with babysitting. In terms of sentry duty when they're out foraging, okay, uh, that tends to be adult males. That tends to be sub-adult Again, one of the, the, one of the uh, lines of thinking there is that the moment you're on sentry duty, when you're standing up, you actually often put, yourselves in, put yourself in a vulnerable position. Meerkats are not great climbers, but they will, they will climb up trees to do sentry duty sometimes. So they'll climb up onto these high exposed positions, and that obviously can increase the likelihood of them getting, getting snatched up by an eagle or something. So the idea there is that, well, the, the young males are more expendable in a group than young females because your females are obviously key for breeding. Um, so it tends to be the young males that get selected. Out of, if, if you've got four or five young males in a group, obviously they will just rotate between them because you, you can't have one young male that's doing sentry duty all the time because otherwise he's never going to get food. Um, so there's, there, there are variations how they, let, let's say hypothetically there were five young males in a group and the group goes out foraging. How they decide which one of those five takes the first shift and then who takes the next one and the next one, next one, that, I don't know. I think I'd have to learn really to, to speak meerkat very, very well, which, I'm, which I can't. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's a very interesting question, you know, in terms of we, we know it's, more, it's most, mostly young males that do sentry duty when they're foraging. It's mostly young females that do babysitting duties um, when, when the alpha female has got small pups. But in terms of the actual selection, if there's a number of subadult males, subadult females, that I'm not sure we've actually figured out how, the, how they do that yet. Good question. Okay, so in the meantime, I think head back to and beyond in Gala and see what they've got for you on that side. Jandre. just come down into the riverbed to see what we could find around here and we've, we've just found these lions. What is quite unusual though and r rather exciting for us is it's actually a different pride of lions to the one that we've been watching over the last two months or so. And so we just, myself and Owen, have just taken the last five minutes to try and put the puzzle pieces together and try and figure out exactly uh, which pride of lions this is and how many there are in this pride. And so far, we see this one down over here. So that's a young female, so it looks like it's a, a little cub. If you look at the legs, very, very spotty. And so probably around uh, maybe about a, a year to a year and a half. And then if we pan slightly further to the right, we'll see another another lion who's taking out his hunger pains on a stick. <laughs> and if you look at that, exactly the same markings around the, the feet. But then if you look at, at the face, very, very hairy. And so it looks like those two could potentially be part of the same litter. So we've got one young female, one young male. There's another male that's slightly bigger slightly further to the right not a very good view in the grass there but if you look at the top of its head you might just be able to see that slightly mohawk style he looks a little bit older maybe in the region of of about two years old and so we've got four lines in total we did see a, an adult female walking in the direction or the opposite direction to where this one's looking and the way that they're looking there there, there could potentially be more lines it's rather quite fa fascinating because this is exactly the last spot where we saw that that pride of lions the birmingham pride cross out of Ngala into the bigger kruger national park on on the east and these ones have come pretty much in exactly the same spot oh cool owen's just spotted another one that he'll get us a view of again through the reeds we haven't really been able to to see it too well. So, I mean, if we if we kind of look back over the last ten years at the, at the different dynamics within Ngala and within um, the lions, 
We used to see a pride, this was way before my time, so I, mean, I don't know the, the full ins and outs of the pride, but there was a pride that used to come into the eastern part of the reserve and used to hang around tented camp, and they called the, the Scoral Pride, and this could potentially be them. I mean, in my time here, of just around two years, I've only seen them once, and so... I think you know, since the Birmingham Pride has moved into this area, they're much bigger. They're quite a fearsome pride to try and, and challenge for territory. And so you know, this pride was more than likely pushed further and further east. So they might just be doing a, a loop within their home range. But still really, really cool to see a different pride of lions. And I'm really quite enjoying trying to put all of the puzzle pieces together. So we've got five lions in total. Um, we mentioned that we did see one adult female that walked from right to left. So like I said, in the opposite direction that that lion and frame is facing. But the way... that in Gala, we've come to one of the water holes that has quite a few hippos and crocodiles, but there is lots of birds around here. Eat over there. All right, so let's start from left to right, Marcel. So you'll see that the one that's busy pruning itself at the moment is a The rainbow we here. Oh, that was a terrible attempt at their call. I do apologize. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry about any technical issues that happened there. I'm not sure what happened there. But uh, you are back with us and Tandy looking so regal in the tree. Looking so magnificent as she sleeps in her apple leaf tree. You would not know she's there, everybody. From the road, you would not see her. This is not the tree I was expecting to find a kill in. The entire time we've been with her, she's been looking in this direction. Vanna even commented she's looking in this direction, but we couldn't see the hyenas. A leopard will always look in the direction of the kill she's got. Or So, as an example, Vanna can show you the tree in the background to reiterate on that question before. There we go. There's a nice marula tree. A big one there. That's the kind of tree you expect to find a leopard taking a kill into. Nice, big, soft branches. Lots of purchase. Lots of area to move in. Um, this tree here is a lot less sort of <laughs> accessible. She's even broken a number of branches to get into it. But at least it'll provide her with some shade. And how on earth a battalier eagle was able to touch as there was a kill here? Just goes to show you how good their eyesight is. Or maybe our batteliers are following these naughty little hyenas that we see. And thanks to, to one of the viewers who've commented back to tell me that this hyena is indeed Comet. He's one of the male hyenas of the Juma clan. Here he is. Sleeping. It's a sleep off between the two of them now. Crowd Color Karuna, you want to know why uh, hyenas are afraid of lions, not leopards? Well, a male leopard 
definitely has the potential to give a hyena a hiding, definitely. A female leopard can injure a hyena, but lions are known to kill them. Um, for example, Tandy, I reckon Tandy weighs in the region of 50 odd kilograms. So that's what, 100, 110 pounds. Whereas Comet over here probably weighs 20 to 30, maybe even more than she does. And he's not a big hyena. Tandy's a small, a small leopard. Um, an animal like Malwati probably weighs in the region of 180, 170 to 200 pounds. I mean, obviously I haven't weighed them, I can't tell you. Whereas a lioness weighs in the region of 280 to 300 pounds, 270 to 300 pounds. The, the, the weight difference, and a male lion can get up to 500 pounds. So 250 kilograms is a big lion, 500 pounds. So a hyena has just got no chance against a lion, not even a lioness. Um, and they're, they're, they're enemies. They've, you know, leopards and lions and hyena all are enemies. None of them are friendly with each other. The lion being the biggest, the biggest in the system will always dominate the smaller. Uh, leopards have evolved by being able to climb up trees. Hyenas by being very quick and uh, athletic. So they're able to, with a lot of stamina, avoid lions. But if a lion gets caught, or a hyena gets caught by a lion, it quite often ends quite badly. Uh, Corky, who was the previous matriarch, was at the den site close to where Trish is uh, this, uh, this, evening, this morning. And uh, one of the Avoca males snuck up on Corky and gave her an absolute hiding. So thankfully, it didn't kill her. But uh, she had wounds for some time. And it's, it's, sometimes you wonder why they don't kill them. Um, but sometimes they do. I had a scene in the Masai Mara where five of the Sosa tree pride females attacked a hyena and it was, it was violent. It was violent to see. So why hyenas, hyenas are afraid, are afraid of, of lion? And in, in the Mara, the, the hyenas essentially come together in much larger groups and they can outcompete smaller groups of lions like the Wino pride that we had up there. Smaller, much smaller pride, clans of 70 hyenas, numbers. It's a numbers game versus a weight game. So uh, leopards are always on their own. Hyenas can be on their own as they are generally here in Juma. <laughs> Melinda, um, I don't know how long she can stay up in this tree, but she looks pretty comfortable. Her back legs are, are in to the, into the bark, the, the claws are latched on. And, she looks pretty comfortable. Cats are very agile. They can sleep wherever they want to. Um, and she's sleeping in a very precarious position. She's probably going to get uncomfortable. Uh, she's probably going to have another meal. And then she's probably going to go find her cub and give the cub some milk. But uh, this kill, I reckon, will still be here this afternoon. So someone will be able to come here, either myself or Trishala. It's a very short vehicle trip here and we'll be able to spend some time with Tandy. Maybe she'll take us to the cub this afternoon, which I'm really, really hoping for. Really, really hoping for. So everybody, we do hope you've enjoyed your morning with us. Thank you from all the wonderful venues, presenters and cam ops. We look forward to catching up with you again this afternoon for a wild and wonderful adventure in the African wilderness. Thanks for your questions and comments and uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We will see you this afternoon from our Johannesburg crew as well. We wish you all a goodbye. Until later on, have a great day until then. See you soon.